Hello, everybody. Welcome to a new episode of The Mid Max Show, a place about games, friends, getting better. Special live episode. I'm Ben Hansen, joined by one Jacob Geller. I'm live. Joined by one Kyle Hilliard. Hello, I'm part of the Red Shirt Gang. Cool guy squad. And we're joined by... Let me really set this up. This is the person that is going to be filling in for Jeff Marchiafava for the next two months while oh, he's out on paternity what? leave. You know that sound of excitement from anywhere. Michael Huber! <laughs> oh, we're live. We're live. <laughs> Welcome to the show, man. Greetings. Honor to have you here. So, just Honor to be very to be. clear, I, I feel like we did this with Trivia Tower as well. Just to be really clear, Huber's filling in for Jeff Marchiafava, so he's not going to yes. be on every episode of the MinMax show, but where it makes sense for him to pop up on MinMax show, on New Show Plus. I'm very excited to have you jump into that. Mm -hmm. A wild fray of different options, Huber. So uh, popping up here and there for the next two months here at MinMax until Jeff Markifava comes back a bigger and better man having raised just, another child. Just a mercenary. Yeah, mercenary for hire. <laughs> but we couldn't ask for a better one. Huber, thank you for being here, sir. Thank you, dude. Um, you My are, pleasure. Yeah, you hosted the last two episodes of Trivia Tower. You're hosting the next one, which we should plug out of the gate, is coming up March 26th. That is it this is. Tuesday yes. um, at 7 p.m. Central, 5 p.m. Pacific. Um, is it weird to host Trivia Tower? I don't think we've really... We've had a lot of specific meetings about Trivia Tower, but not just like a general one. But how is it actually putting that show together? Uh, it's a fair amount of work, but it is so much fun. Yeah. It's, it's a lot of just kind of Googling games and just yeah. piddling by yourself. But then you realize, like, the payoff is actually getting to scream while look looking at people try to guess these things. And it always gets competitive. It's yes. always more intense than you think it's going to be every episode. It's like, oh, that's the payoff. That's the fun totally. part, you know? It's so much fun. Awesome. Um, do you want to announce who the guest is for this Tuesday's episode? Yeah. Are we allowed to do this? Yeah. Go yeah. for it, man. <laughs> Roger's base. Roger's base joining us. Be there. Yes, on this episode of Trivia Tower. So if you jump in again and support MinMax on Patreon at even the two dollar tier, you can compete in game trivia. And we have a ton of codes to give away for stuff like Astro Duel Two. Um, the number one winner gets an Astro headset. No relation on the Astro front. But then <laughs> if you make it to the fifth floor, we have five codes for Final Fantasy VII Rebirth that we're giving away as well. So best of luck to everybody in Trivia Tower. Huber, thank you for being yeah, here, and yeah. thank you for being on top of all of these games, man, because, good lord, today we're talking about uh, Dragon's Dogma 2, which you finished, Huber? Yeah. Frickin' sweet. I can't wait to dive into that. Uh, we're gonna be talking about Princess Peach Showtime, which, Kyle, you're actually cosplaying as? You're so excited about it? That's right. You seem... I didn't finish it, too. Are you not impressed by that? I'm decently impressed. I feel like I haven't started that game, and I've already, like, half-finished it. <laughs> um, let's see, Rise of the Ronin, uh, we're going to be talking about that a little bit, and then we're going to talk about some smaller games, but still strong, uh, gigantic games. Uh, Death of a Wish, Boar Blasters, I want to talk a little bit about, um, and then back half of the show, we have some wonderful questions that people submitted over there on Patreon, support us in on Patreon, you can submit a question each and every week for the show. Um, here's the thing, last little plug thing. Um, we have some game codes to give away. If you're watching this on YouTube, if you're listening on a podcast app other than Apple Podcasts, good on you. You absorb this show how you want to absorb it. Uh, whatever you want to do. Rub your face against the computer monitor while YouTube's playing. However you want it, soak it into your veins is okay with us. But here's the thing. If you subscribe to the Apple Podcast version of the MinMax show uh, this week, so Thursday or Friday, subscribe to the Apple Podcast version of the MinMax show, leave a review, and include some way to contact you, like your Discord name or Twitter handle. Uh, leave a review, include a way to contact you, and you're automatically in the running to win a code for Sea of Stars on Steam or Grand Blue Fantasy Relink on PlayStation 5. And so we'll randomize who gets that, but we have a total of four codes. We're going to be giving those out to folks who subscribe to the MinMax show on Apple Podcasts and leave a review. We'll reach out to you. Um, hey, GDC! was this week. We got a lot of games nice. to talk about. And so GDC, the Game Developers Conference, um, I was out there with Haley McLean and Jenna Garcia. It was her first time at the show. Uh, Leo Vader was also out there shooting something special and different from the rest of us. But we kind of have two travelogues, if you want to look at that way, uh, coming up soon. So look forward to that on MinMax's YouTube channel. Uh, but it was a whirlwind week for me. It was a lot of talking to developers, a lot of talking to people in the press. Have you been to GDC, Huber? Never been. Are you ever tempted? Yeah. 
Usually, uh, usually like Bloodworth will go. Yeah. That's like a Bloodworth joint. You don't get to raise your hand and be so. like, this time, Blood, sit down. I'm going to sprint <laughs> in front of you, man. It's fun. I like I, I have such a good time with that show. And it's just, it's amazing to see so many developers. Uh, it's dumb to say the word mingling, but that is the exciting thing. Just like seeing, you know, when the industry has been such a bummer, very rightfully over the last year and a half, at least at this point, it's just like, it fills you with a breath of fresh air to like, you know, I went to a panel on the animation of Spider-Man 2 probably the most impressive animation in a game ever at this point. Um, and just going to a panel like that and ha just seeing like who gets up to ask questions at the end and seeing just like Japanese game developers get up and asking Insomniac, like, how did you do this? Like, how how do you make the transitions <laughs> from cutscenes to gameplay? Like, what are the secrets that you guys have here? And everyone's so open. You know, I went to like so a cool. Final Fantasy 16 panel and they're just showing like super crude in-engine stuff showing how they put together all the cutscenes of that game. There's just a That's ton. So fun. Yeah, it's just like everyone's casual, let their guard down. And it's just like this push for transparency and sharing knowledge. Yeah. And it's just like, it fills you with a good vibe, man. Because this industry is like so unnecessarily secret so sometimes i feel like yeah well so but, it's really cool that everyone is just like hey let's like talk about these things how would we do these things yeah because the beauty is like i mean we normally we're lucky if we get to interact directly with developers right and a lot of it's going through pr and so their job is to be selectively secret very understandably yeah. you know what i mean and so just <laughs> seeing like oh when it's just developers on developers and they can just let her rip that's the good stuff that's where you're actually learning like okay mm -hmm. this is where these games are actually coming from. But uh, we're going to have an episode of Bonus Pod, which is our Patreon exclusive podcast coming out on Monday. Um, and that's going to be um, all of us sharing everything we learned at GDC this year, kind of unpacking the trip, sharing tidbits from panels, stuff like that. Some of the games that we played. Jacob Geller, I did get to play um, World of Goo too, though, which I was very excited Ooh. about. Nice. And I got to like meet uh, Ron Carmel. Like, I'm. I love that first game so much. That game was so important to me. So I actually like sit down for the demo and be like, hi, Ron, nice to meet you. I'll be playing your game now. And I've it's... listened to your soundtrack 1,000 times. <laughs> it's absurd. But it's fun to I like... I used it in a documentary. <laughs> That's true. Um, but yeah, it's just like, it's fun to get back in the in the groove of World of Goo and realize like, oh, all the muscle memories. Okay, that's right. You hit those little white flying uh, little flies to reset like a short period, like all those little shortcuts and stuff had to come pouring back in. But it turns out- uh, I've only ever played it with a Wiimote. So I hope they've included <laughs> that as a possibility. You can use the Joy-Con and it kind of feels like a Wiimote. Um, oh, and then right. for the Switch version, you can play co-op with six players, which Whoa. I was just playing with Haley and it was like, already chaos with the two of us because it was like all right build a bridge go 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 and all of us just like flying I was like, okay if we stop and actually talk about where we're placing these goo balls there might be a fun strategy involved but it's like it's you got to be selective so with six people it's going to be chaotic it's <laughs> hopefully a fun level of chaos and the big thing with world of goo too is the um like they're focusing on liquids this time around like there's certain goo balls that won't activate until they get wet very naturally like gremlins i suppose um and so you're trying to make like liquid pour down or like fly up or like launch liquid across uh to activate the different goo balls and stuff but i'm very excited about that game and it's coming out may 23rd 2024 but there's a ton more that we played um at the event we'll be talking about it on bonus pod again so thanks for supporting min max on patreon and locking that podcast in your favorite podcast app Huber, what are we doing? Why aren't we talking about Dragon's Dogma 2 right now? Dude, Dragon's Dogma 2. <laughs> Holy crap. It's just consumed your life? Yeah, this game, this is a special game. This Ooh. game is so good. It definitely goes against some norms that like people are used to. Yeah. So there's a lot of there's a lot of like obstacles that you must overcome, similar to the first game. So if you play the first one, you know, you're familiar with the, you know, difficult fast travel, like walking everywhere. Right. Uh, so so th all of that kind of is, is retained here. And then one of the big things is like the quests. 2024, because there's been so many RPGs, has kind of like made me turn against side quests. <laughs> Ooh, what you can just you can look. I know it's. A lightning round of this podcast are you just pointing a finger at rebirth are you are you just singling a, a it out a tiny bit a tiny bit for yeah. sure even like like a, the like smallest a dragon. finger just the I'll, smallest I'll, finger. Put, I'll point all five yeah. hand fingers in that I, direction but kyle you could you know? just make it like one baby's pinky instead of all five i'd feel better <laughs> even like even infinite wealth even banishers yeah just a lot of these 
games will just be like, okay, do a main quest. All right, here's eight hours of side stuff. Go do that. Okay, here's one more main quest. Here's, you know, so it's like, they just like dump it all on you. Yeah. And Dragon's Dogma has like no, there's no like question marks over people's heads. To get a quest from people, you just like talk to them. And there's people everywhere, so you're forced to really... And most of them don't have quests. A lot of like, them don't have quests. Yeah. And that's just refreshing, because it just it feels less checklisty than a lot of open 100%. world games. 100%. Okay. And then a lot of the objectives, like, are very obscure. It'll be like, hey, figure out how this person does this thing. That's it. It's like, what? H how do I... How do I go about doing that? What do you mean? <laughs> right. So it's very hands off, which I absolutely just love. It, it forces you to really immerse yourself in the world. Because if you're paying attention to like some of the NPCs, not everyone, like you were saying, not everyone gives you a quest, but sometimes you'll be in town and you'll, you'll just hear a guy talking where he'll be like, oh, this just isn't right. What am I going to do? And it's like, hmm, maybe I should talk to that guy. So like there are little cues to to help guide you, but there's just the sense of discovery in this game, whether you're finding a quest or finding a cave or or just find like there's just so much to find and it's all so meaningful and rewarding. This game is amazing. Okay, great. Okay, I'm trying <laughs> can to I give out. hang on before. Can you I give can... like my my take? I don't want your take. I don't want your take. I okay. want everyone to sit down. No takes. I won't do here. it. Won't I want it. <laughs> I wouldn't want something as interesting as a take. What I want is our account, baby. Like Jacob Killer, how much have you played of Dragon's Dogma Two? Oh, that's a good question. I think like fifteen hours. Okay, great. I am at the very beginning. Believe it or not, I played a little bit this morning after I got back from GDC. But Hubert, I mean, you beat it. Do you have any idea how much time you spent with this thing? Uh, fifty plus. Okay, Jesus Christ! Yeah, like fifty, like fifty. Okay, and I'm, in twenty twenty four, that has somehow become a reasonable number. That that's I'm the like, median <laughs> time to beat a game. Now. <laughs> yeah, I'm like three or four hours in or something. Okay, like that. perfect. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um. Oh, whoops! Hang on. <laughs> hang on. I broke the podcast. Okay, Jacob, uh -huh. I'm ready for your uh, your spiciest hot take. I mean, my so my take, which is. Uh, Michael, first of all, uh, we were on a podcast for the first time like uh, two months ago. I've yeah. since learned that we have really similar taste in games. Like when sure. I see you like tweeting about things, I'm like, oh, I feel the same way. <laughs> um, and I I didn't play Dragon's Dogma 1 or I played it for like three hours. So I feel like a lot of people who are out of the bat super hyped on this game are kind of like, I've been telling everyone for 10 years <laughs> that this game is awesome. And now you'll believe me. Um but, like, it feels to me like this is an example of if you take every quality of life improvement that we've made to games out of a game, suddenly it becomes a really compelling experience in a way that, like, those other yeah. games aren't. Where it's <laughs> yes. like, actually, if you make everything hard and not like the combat not not like how hard it is to beat a boss but like how hard it is to get from one city to another mm -hmm. then then like that has a kind of stacking effect where it's just like every system gets more interesting yes dude yes like the money in this game i love video game economies money in this game is so valuable i needed it the entire time because you have multiple classes and each class uses kind of their own gear. So like that stuff gets really expensive. Even to like get the best gear for like one class is very expensive. You also use money to like do other quest related things. You can like buy thing really expensive things in town. So like because it is so difficult to get places and because the game is so challenging, money matters more, gear matters more leveling up matters more like anytime that stuff hits it's just like yes it, it, it's <laughs> like you will resting at inns is incredibly important in this game yeah. because it's like one of the only ways to like fully heal yourself after a long journey and once i did this really really long journey like yeah. inadvertently long and i got to the town There's and there were that. like there were like hey here's the inn feel free to stay with us Ten thousand gold <laughs> yeah <laughs> like, this is that is <laughs> awesome. <laughs> and I was like, what is happening? It's such a weird idea because it's early on in the game, there's a pop-up that's like, 
hey, look, there are auto saves in this game, but eh, don't rely don't on them. Trust these them. Yeah, these <laughs> auto saves are basically meaningless. It's like, okay, even that pitch, it's like, okay, this is an odd tone. Because, yeah, I'm with you, Kyle, where I didn't really play the first Dragon's Dogma much at all, but I, I love the people who have been super enthusiastic about it. And so to jump into this and be like, you can feel the weight of the legacy systems and it just makes it more charming. Yeah. But I'm trying to think of like, you know, in this world where having an open world game that's a little wonky, a little retro is maybe too, I don't know, too far of a stretch, but like it's odd and odd is a benefit uh, in the current state of open world games. Is is the closest analog here Elden Ring? or Other than Dragon's Dogma 1, I'm trying to think of I like... Feel like I feel like it threads the needle really smartly with something as hardcore as Elden Ring, but then also like your Assassin's Creed. Cause like you can go out into town or you can go out into the, you know, on the roads and when you're fighting like the trash mobs, it's like pretty chill, you know? And, and it's, it is always like the side quests are very obscure, but the main quests like, that's a little more guided so you always kind of know okay i have to do that's the main quest to like advance uh so i feel like it it kind of takes a little bit just from a lot of open world games to make its own its own thing but it definitely has some hardcoreness that is comparable to a from game for sure yeah or almost like a Gosh, I don't know, like a long dark or like one of those kind of survival games, yeah. because oh, like weird. there's a lot of like like ca camping. Camping yeah. is really important, you know, and it's like being able to sleep is like a core mechanic of the game. Mm -hmm. And if you like can't find somewhere to sleep, then like things get bad real fast. And so there <laughs> yeah. is this it almost reminds me of like the mods that people have made of Skyrim to make it more demanding where it's like mm -hmm. oh you have to like eat all the time and like you can't use fast travel and you only have to take you know it's like wagons are kind of your you can fast travel in kind of a traditional way but it's really expensive you right. can take wagons from place to place they're cheaper but like there are no wagon game wagon trips in this game that aren't interrupted by like a cyclops attacking yeah. <laughs> your wagon and then during the course of that fight the wagon will probably be Smashed. destroyed and, yeah. then, and then you're just like in the middle of nowhere just <laughs> having fought a cyclops and it's like guess i gotta find somewhere to sleep now and so it like it really it is it is like almost the survival game huh. in just kind of like how much you kind of have to think about like your path it's like would it be crazy to say death stranding it's kind of a game about walking <laughs> sure that honestly that's the most exciting thing i've heard about this game yet the idea of like okay it should be a big journey if you're in a whole fantasy world trying to go from one town to yep. another and just to have a standard idea of like okay it's a hop skip and a jump it's just you know distance is basically meaningless in a lot of modern open world games but to have this mm -hmm. one feel like look i know here where i'm playing with fire a little more lord of the ringsy of like you totally feel like you're truly going on an adventure bonding with your pawn ship <laughs> it did, so it is that feeling of like all right we're gonna walk across a mountain for a long time together but by god <laughs> we're gonna get to know each other at that point yeah or or kind of like what people talk about like the first season of game of thrones versus yeah. the last that's exactly where it's like in the, it yes in in the first season <laughs> yeah. it takes them it takes them like the whole season to get to the capital and then by the last they're like fast traveling all around the continent <laughs> just like boom, boom get there yeah, you say like, ah, oh, there's trash mobs everywhere. What are you going to do? Uh, but it was amazing, like, even early on when I was just running around, I had like, you know, two pawns with me. I had like the one pawn that you create, right? Which, yeah. by the way, I should say pawns are like the servants in this world at the best shorthand for what's going on here. Friendly yeah. servants. It's a single player game, but you can recruit other people's pawns. Your pawn can be recruited. So you have, it's you, your creative character, your pawn, and then two additional pawns that you can hire yeah they so have like a party of four for like yeah, the, the whole game huh. the the hired pawns never level up or anything so you have to like swap them out for higher level ones as you keep rising in level your main pawn you know can can level up and stuff so yeah. you're encouraged to like constantly cycle out your other two pawns okay uh and they just kind of yeah they just follow you around you can re recruit like whichever class you want you know sometimes the classes won't be available, so you kind of have to like pick and choose, you know, which which pawns you hire. Um, yeah, that was interesting. I'm curious how much they're going to talk to each other because early on they were talking to each other, which is very exciting. But it was like 
I noticed you're a different class than I am is basically yeah. the extent of the conversation. Do they actually have distinct personalities or is it just kind of mechanical talking about systems oh, type of stuff? A little bit. It is really like you, you find yourself. They, they are endearing because they like, I'm usually not into created characters in RPGs because I like to find, you know, I like Barrett. I like Tifa. I like, yeah. you know, I like defined characters, but when you're in a battle and they're like cheering you on and then you conquer it together and then they give each other like a little high five, like they really have a good, just a good vibe. Yeah. I, um, I was charmed by the having like a group with me. This, this sounds like an insult, but I actually, I really quite liked it where it was like, we were all fighting, you know, like one monster, right? There was like one left. And it just reminded me of like watching a little kid's soccer game because like they were just <laughs> all this big group of like the pawns, like they feel like childish to me because they're like supposed to be almost like mindless husks that just mm -hmm. sort of like do your bidding. And they're all just sort of chasing this little guy around, like doing the best they can to fight him. And I'm just like <laughs> the dad off on the sideline, like, yeah, hey, you guys are doing great. <laughs> yeah, it's like they, they are kind of, they have just enough in there to like make yeah. the pawns interesting that it's like, look, I, I, you know, walking around the city, I've heard one pawn say like, ah, oh, there ought a ladder yonder. And then your <laughs> other pawn says like, indeed, we could make use of such a thing. I've like heard them say that like 40 times. But, you know, sometimes you're a, like, you know, we've talked about like, okay, the, the quest markers for this game are really kind of general and they often give you like an area, but sometimes you're in that area and the pawn who has presumably done that quest in mm -hmm. someone else's mm -hmm. game right. is like, hey, I know where we're going. And then yeah. you can like tell them and they will lead you like straight to the objective in this like really interesting way where it's like, oh, this is, you know, th this feels even though you're basically just following an NPC to a location, mm -hmm. it feels kind of like generative and interesting in a way that like, if, you know, if Tifa said, I know where we're going, let me, you know, follow me, it wouldn't feel quite as like dynamic. Disagree. Totally. Um, I would follow her <laughs> the ends of the earth. Look, and I love Tifa. <laughs> no, but and, I... they, uh, and you start to rely on them because one, yeah, they'll guide you to the quest, but then two, because of the character classes, like you need um, a healer and you need a person with range. So you start to rely on these pawns. They're very capable in combat. Actually, it's really good. Do you believe that idea of like, they won't say anything unless they're being pulled in from somebody else's game? Cause even early on, it's like, I have a feeling that, actually, I know for a fact there's a treasure chest hiding in these woods right here. And it's like, it, it, does it matter if it's actually <laughs> informed by another experience or just like, well, because I know that there is like this weird online connectivity hive mind happening here that's all you need is for the magic all that matters is that you believe yeah man <laughs> the rp the rp is strong in this game <laughs> yes i'm believing in the system architecture but that's what you need no but what i was gonna say is uh, earlier on i mean just with the trash mobs walking around like it it surprised me where my pawns are walking down the path and just saying some nonsense like oh, early griffin gets the worm and then like a harpy came down and just like grabbed her and just like lifted her up into the sky <laughs> and was like, what the hell? I'm watching. And then she just like drops her and kills her because she drops her. It was incredible. I was like, okay, this is a more interesting world than I think I was expecting jumped into this sucker. One of my favorite interactions where I like, I was like, oh my gosh, I didn't know that could happen. It's like, I was fighting some, I was like a magical creature or something that had an attack that was like blasting me up into the air. And so it's just like going up and then I was falling. And then I was like, gonna hit the ground, take a bunch of fall damage. And then a pawn just catches me. It's like, Whoa. it got underneath my character gotcha. and just like caught me. And I was like, <laughs> I've got you master. And it's like that, you know, it's like, that doesn't feel fake. I'm sure if they were not in that particular moment, they wouldn't it's like it didn't teleport them under me but it just there are these interactions that happen or like you know you you get stomped and you're kind of crawling around and it like helps you up or whatever and it just like they they feel it's almost like the jankiness makes them feel more real in a way totally. it's like they, right. they kind of have these impressive moments that suddenly break them out of being like just a dumb npc what is going on? Um, what should we know from the first games? Because I'm guessing there's going to be a lot of people jumping in who didn't play this or Dark Arisen. So, like, there, there's a whole, like, throne scene in the beginning. Like, is, yeah. is that me in that scene? It, 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 
the first you don't even really need anything from the first one seriously okay yeah, that, scene, that scene gets such... explained like two hours later oh is yeah. that okay yeah i'm such a stickler for oh but i didn't play the first one i gotta play this one like that is me you do not need to play dragon's dogma one to have okay. any yeah you are not missing anything i promise it dragon dogma one is incredible but as far as like story and all that goes like you're fine just the basic premise of dragon takes your heart and you're in arisen and you have to like slay that dragon to get your heart back basically in, in a nutshell okay so the yeah, arisen I think, I think the store the two games actually i think they take place side by side even like, I don't think it's like, you know, okay. here's what happens after the events of Dragon's Dogma 1. Interesting. Mm -hmm. So Arisen means you're an undead person that came back and you can control pawns and... Yeah, also have been like marked by the dragon. Okay. By stealing yeah. your little heart with his huge claw. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> <laughs> it's absurd. Um, okay. I do have... I, I There are things where I was thinking... It's like a lot of the systems are pretty opaque and it was one of those things where it's like i kind of wished i had a guides or like subreddits to look at when i was playing this pre-release yeah not to like find out how to do a quest but just kind of like basic mechanical things that i don't really know how to do and i feel like it, it's almost a souls game experience where like my guess is if you played dragon's dogma one you would get these sort of things but like the game keeps giving me scrolls that say that it, like, unlocks a skill for, like, me and the pawn, and I don't know how to use them. Like, I don't, I don't know, and I just keep, like, putting them in my holding chest because I'm getting overburdened constantly, and so I have these things, but it's like, there are, you get a lot of items in these games, and, like, most of the items I kind of don't know how to interact with them meaningfully. <laughs> Elden Ring there is, us that's there good, is some actually. of that. There is some of that for sure. But I feel like the the crafting materials at least are a little streamlined. Like there's way less materials than like The Witcher Three, yeah, something like that. So I, I like there are there are, there is a lot of stuff you're picking up, but I still feel like it is pretty streamlined. I don't know, but I totally get that criticism of like, what does this even do? Like the encumbrance is so brutal. So it's like, you don't even want to carry anything ever. You just like store everything in my storage. You got any Yeah. It's like, you don't, you don't know what's important. I, I feel like is one of the things mm. where it's like, you have a really low load limit, you know, that yeah. like your character will become heavy almost immediately. You and so it's like camping. The camping gear is so heavy. The camping gear is like 30% of your total. Load. It's like, I, that's camping, cool. That and then I have armor and then it's like, that's it. Yeah. And so it's like, it's cool. And you can give stuff to the pawns and have them carry it, which is also neat. But it's, yeah, it's like, I kill the Cyclops. Should I take everything from the Cyclops? Like, is it, is it valuable? And then it's like, you've got Cyclops meat in your backpack and then it just starts rotting. And so then you're carrying like rotten meat around that you can't do anything with. But like, it's kind of cool because like, the food goes bad and so you have to use the food when it's fresh and so it's just like it is really it is really a role-playing game and there are like a lot of kind of mechanical rpg choices that you're making that you don't have to make in kind of the more streamlined yep. versions yeah a lot of quests have multiple outcomes as well which is really cool so like i was getting I, every decision i made was wrong Every time I showed mercy, it was it was bad. Someone did something bad. Every time I was like, I'm going to kill this person, they would be like, yo, that person was innocent. Like, what are you doing? <laughs> it was bad. It was bad news. I mean, are there any basic tips for beginners, Huber? People that didn't play Dragon's Dogma 1? I mean, for, for Jacob or anybody else here? Um get through get through a little bit of of the jank early on you know for example there's no lock on in combat right you're just like what even is why is there no lock on I mean, and yeah, I, that was, that's a question like because yeah. people defend it right like what, what is the advantage like why is there a reason or i, I truly don't know but <laughs> after a little like immediately because because the first one same thing so after a little bit or, or just right when I started, I was like, oh, yeah, I forgot there's no lock on like and like the harpies flying around and I'm like trying to like just like do that. But then eventually it's like you just you just get used to it and you don't even you don't even think about it anymore. I also because a lot of the enemies are like super big. Yeah. So it's like you don't even need to really lock onto these these big freakos because you just like grab onto them. 
you know and you're so actually it's like, climbing around there weren't really a lot of times where not being able to lock on bothered me it just took a little getting used to okay um, i just didn't know yeah. if there was like some like this is why we do it you know yeah i don't know answer. why actually okay. that's a great question I, I think, think it's it's just on... removing quality of life features, <laughs> and it kind of makes it interesting. <laughs> is it? The other thing, early yeah. on, I was fighting. It was like one of my first fights, and it was like press the Y button when the creature flinches, and like that was like take that that tooltip was like taking up the whole screen, and mm -hmm. I was like, what 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 is flinching? Like, what does that mean? What am I looking for? Am I looking just for like kinda, it kind of staggers? I think there's an audio okay. cue there too. You'll kind of like hear like a little. <sighs> okay, maybe that's what I was because yeah. I was really like I don't. What can you like? Can you give me a, like a little video on the corner or something? <laughs> like, what am I looking for here? Okay, um, totally. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. I have I have more questions. Um, I I started my class was like immediately in these games. I'm like big sword guy. That's who I want to be. And sure. so I I went. I was big sword guy. I've now like fully leveled up that class. I feel like I should be switching. Right. Like there are advantages to kind of like should I. I don't I don't feel like I should just stick with the same thing for the whole you should, time. Yeah. You should definitely level up a couple because uh-huh so so if if you don't know there's like a bunch of classes in the game there's even a couple secret ones you can find uh but you have your overall character level and then you level up each class when the the things that carry over are the augments so you'll level up the classes and unlock augments which are like you have more physical defense you have more magic defense so some of those good ones are under like mage mage's last level for example is like you have improved stamina recovery that's super good for a lot of classes but again that's like leveling mage all the way up then there's what was it it was like fighter i think has one where it's like you can carry more stuff so definitely just finding like looking ahead of what those augments are is probably pretty smart and it doesn't take an insanely long time to level up the classes but definitely like take a peek and and see so, what what so you i should change maybe min I've been, max it perhaps bleh. i've been playing i think it's thief for the the two um in the same way jacob's like big sword guy i'm like yeah two little swords and i'll be happy yeah um so i should like level that up and then switch to a different class but i'll be able to retain yeah. some of the bonuses yeah, those augments. It's a it's a oh, tab. You'll okay. see augments. You can equip yeah. up to six of them. Yeah, and like like some of the earliest level ones are really good. I think like uh, the the warrior fighter or whatever level two is like increased defense. So maybe just get that really quick. Put it on your thief. Oh, and then go, okay, so, okay, and then you just I, go I just, right I'm back. I'm not. I don't like jumping around classes and stuff in general, right? Like, like I, it's so fun. I but do it. Do it. Do it. I promise. Yeah, it's Get out of so my fun. Zone. They all feel so different. It's so fun. Like, but Michael, like, I like figuring out the one and getting good at the one. I don't want it to feel different. <laughs> But you'll go, you'll get back to it. That's what's really fun is when you like yeah. level up some. And then if you're going on like a strong, a really hard mission, it's like, yo, I'm going to switch back to the one, my main class. But it's like, oh, I'm going to go on a side quest and like go out in the wilderness. I'm going to level up like this or whatever. So fun. Like the big sword class is so slow. Like if you miss one attack, you are hosed. It is awesome. so slow. But then you have like the mage who can like stand in the back and is just like, it takes a second to cast a spell, but then you're just like raining fire, raining electricity. Like they all feel so different and so fun. It's crazy. Right. Um, okay. My last question is what is, when should I be like shadow of the Colossus saying up a guy? Cause <laughs> always, I kind of, always, okay, always cause up it's a like, guy. I've been playing big sword guy and I'm like, I <laughs> think I'm doing more on the ground than when I like yeah. clamor on this. guy. <laughs> Dude, the, 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 was it, is it warrior and fighter? Warrior is the huge sword. Warrior mm -hmm. has that move where you like charge your sword or whatever, and then just jump up and like knock a big ogre down. So yeah, it's usually great. that, that class on the ground is probably the best, but I was like, I was a fighter a lot. So I was just like climbing on and they have a move where you can just like continually stab over and over. It's freaking awesome. It's like my favorite thing to do all year. God, this is this is wooing me. Like honestly, hearing about like just long distance between times. Like I start again. It's like I don't think this is my cup of tea. I'm not big yeah. into fantasy. I don't know. I don't know. I don't oh. know. But hearing this, man. All right, the oddity. Just give is it a side. little hump. Like it'll it'll click. 
it'll click. It'll get you. Okay. But it does. It does take a while. Like okay. I will. I I think it's like I think the first maybe eight hours are like. I was kind of like, okay, when's the like special thing gonna? Because <laughs> wow, from, okay. from the trailers, from the trailers, you think you're gonna be fighting like giant things all the yep, time, yep. and it's like really you're fighting a lot of goblins. You know, yeah, for like good. a lot of this game, you're fighting goblins, and so it's not the appeal is not what I thought it was going to be, which was like, oh my gosh, Cyclops, Griffins, like jumping out everywhere. It's like those yeah. fights are there and they're cool, but it is more kind of an experiential game. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Kyle, put on uh, your cool guy prediction hat, please. Okay. Is this going to be a hit? Uh, yeah, I think it already is. Already is. Already huge. Yeah. Uh, predict yeah. predict the, the scale. The first one sold like seven million. Wait, really? Yeah, with like Dark Arisen and everything, Lifetime, it's up to like seven mil. Okay, Kyle, I mean, give me uh, total sales by the end of the year. What are we looking at for Dragon's Dogma 2? And say sales, it, and I, say it confidently. Not, just like just say it with no. Though, just it's... say it confidently, please. Okay, but I don't have a good sense of what is good sales for like a game. They don't share totally. those numbers. A lot of people. <laughs> like, yeah, Capcom, Capcom totally does. shares the numbers. Yeah, a lot of companies <laughs> share the numbers. Uh, th three, three, four million. Four million. Thirty-four million. No, th four, four million. Four million. I don't know. Didn't Michael just say that the original sold seven, right? Well, that's but over the it, lifetime. It did come ten years ago, but but yeah, I think that's what I'm saying. it's I not think, gonna it's yeah. not gonna like exceed that, but it's gonna be okay. good for what it is. I think Resident Evil Four remake. I think they said it was at five million. I think okay, recently three, uh, three 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 million three, for three by the end of the year. Hubert, are you going with fifty million for this one, or where are you at? <laughs> <laughs> Dragon's Dogma Two is gonna sell by the end of the year. Yeah. Ooh, I'm gonna say. I'm gonna say like eight million. What the okay. hell? Yeah. This yeah, is your the chance nice thing, to Michael. Is at the end of the year, you can find just weird sources without any like, you know, His... and they're just like claiming sales numbers. Capcom and posts data. their official sales yes. numbers. They're the one company that does. <laughs> yeah, it. give them credit. Huh? Yeah, the source is gonna be a Google Doc that Michael Huber sends our way. It's gonna be pretty <laughs> sweet. Uh, all right, you heard it here first, everybody. Eight mil. Uh, <laughs> Jesus, this is another Tears of the Kingdom situation, Huber. I don't know. No, it's just, it's this awesome. Is gonna, this is like going to be like Helldivers, dude. I swear. Where it, people are just going to be like obsessed. It has a chance. It has like a chance for that Elden Ring. This sounds derogatory and I don't mean it that way. Just Elden Ring runoff slop. You know, if like <laughs> everyone's craving it before the DLC comes out for Elden Ring, I feel like there's going you to know? be people that are going to be super eager to jump into this thing and just share secrets about the world. But it's awesome. It's awesome they made it. I mean, 12 years after that first game came out, Weird cult classic, just slowly building up steam, and yeah, they finally did it. Took a big swing. Hopefully, it pays off for Capcom because that's a freaking cool game. And yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Huber, I mean, this is gross. If you had to guess where it's going to be, like in your end of the year top ten, I, like oh. how much do you love this thing? I'm still trying to get a read. I'm, I'm actually, I, I'm like deeply in love. Like I loved Dragon's Dogma one yeah. with all of my heart, and this this game was it was very very special when i finished it was like this even during it like when i was playing it at a lot of parts there were so many moments where i was like this feels so special this is the feeling that i don't necessarily chase but i crave because i play so many video games like for for a game to affect me this way is still rare yeah. So yeah, this is this is very very high on my list. Is it topping Rebirth? They're they're different. I've seen mm. I've seen people talking about both of these lately together very in the same sentence. Answer. <laughs> <laughs> like Rebirth has a way better story in my mind. Not to say Dragon's Dogma story is bad. There's cool characters and cool quests. Yeah. But like, holy shit, Rebirth story. Rebirth mini games. Rebirth's budget. <laughs> oh, that like, budget is lot, sweet. There's a lot to love about both, but I oh. love how hardcore Dragon's Dogma is. Like, you God. get what you put into it. Yeah. I love budget. Oh, God, it's like budget. top three favorite things. <laughs> I love yeah. budgets, yes. Yeah, if, only, if only Dragon's Dogma 2 had a Mako vacuum. <laughs> oh, can you imagine? I want to ride it up the side of a unicorn or whatever the hell's going on in the game. <laughs>
Uh, all right, hey, for a game um, that's all about switching classes, which Kyle says he hates to do, uh, Princess Peach Showtime. <laughs> nice. uh, let me just stay the chef the entire game. Uh. <laughs> I, I would have liked to play a yeah Princess Peach Ninja game. That'd been all right. Okay, so this is the new Switch game where uh, Princess Peach is putting on a show, and then she's jumping between a bunch of different roles to help help yeah. put on that show. Well, it's uh, she's she's stopping the 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 sour grape bunch. She's not <laughs> okay. like putting on a show per se. I suppose it's it's an action game. You know? Okay, Kyle. Yeah. Um, I asked you earlier in the week, or I guess in Slack, we're talking about like um, Princess Peach Showtime, and you were in the camp of like, ah, I guess I could talk about it. And then I saw you yeah. gave it like a seven five, and I'm like, that, that's a decent score. Is it just so boring Swim of a game? Peach. Oh, hang on, hang on. Are we swimming? Are we swimming here? So what? What is I your mean, read thing, on this thing? It's it's that thing. The reason that I'm kind of like shoulder shrug, like eh, about it is like seven seven five. Like it's fine right it's not <laughs> it's not good to the point where i'm like excited to talk about it it's not bad to the point where i'm like can you believe this this is fun to talk about <laughs> it's just this like totally middle of the road platformer that had some cool bits and sometimes underwhelmed and like some of the costumes i i didn't really like none of them are like terrible yeah but like there there's like the detective one in particular i didn't i was like always kind of a slog and was like sort of bummed when i had to play those levels but then like like i said like the ninja one's like a lot of fun because she has these weird cool like stealth mechanics and stuff and yeah uh, but it's all simplified right it's not it's not actually a stealth game but it kind of it kind of looks like one which which is sort of fun so it's just a game where you're kind of, even though there's cool creativity in there, you feel like you're kind of going through the motions of like, all right, it's just a lot of combat that you're not going to think too much about. Yeah, yeah. And it's like, it's, the thing that's tricky about it is like, it's it's for younger players. Yeah. Like I could see this being the first game for a lot of people. Like it's it's below Kirby, sort of on the challenge. Below tier. Kirby? Wow. Yeah. Whoa. And like, cause, cause Kirby can get challenging sometimes. Like the recent one, the last the, like half optional game. stuff. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um. But and, but the thing is, is like, it's it's very easy by design, which is like okay, that's what they were going for. But then there are a couple like platforming moments, and there's like a couple combat moments that do require like specific button pressing and stuff like that that I could see young players getting frustrated with. Sure. And it's like, I, I almost wish they'd gone sort of tipped one way or the other. It's like, let's make it e even easier than it is, or let's let's make it challenging and, and harder. Yeah. So it, That's it, what I love about Mario games every time is like, if you do the optional stuff, it can be insanely difficult. But yeah. then if you just stick to like the main the main missions like you're 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 pretty good you could get through that but yeah yeah the other the optional like challenge roads and stuff are insane it would be awesome yeah. if there was just like the end game for princess peach was like the hardest stuff nintendo's <laughs> yes. ever designed like why not just throw one little nugget in there that's impossible just so people like, talk about the it. parent right it's like playing yeah. with their kid it's like this one's for you like <laughs> right stay up <laughs> late and beat your head way. against the wall trying to play this yeah. freaking thing it's called yeah. the parent stage. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. it must That'd be this cool. tall to enter. So, uh, Kyle, the vibe I'm getting is it's the same developer uh, as Yoshi's Crafted World. It feels oh, yeah. so like they it's... finally told us who developed it. That is the most frustrating. I, mean, I found thing. out looking in the credits. That's how I found out. the best way to learn something. And look, yeah, yeah. I I love. Why was that so? Why was that not? revealed what, what was that about it's the There's same nonsense that nintendo pulled when it's like who's the new voice of mario i don't know play the game look at the credits it's like and i <laughs> you know i had uh we played um some games at uh nintendo for uh, gdc here and they had like a big intro presentation about the nintendo games and they <laughs> had in that intro video like we at Nintendo, above all, respect developers and all this stuff. It's like, I wanted to raise my hand and be like, uh, you're refusing to tell us who made these games until they're on store shelves. Uh, but, uh, Kyle, is this going to be the biggest original Switch game in 2024? Oh, the biggest original? Well, no. And I say that also not knowing what the rest of the year holds. I think Paper Mario will probably be a bigger hit. Than this. No, 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 no. Yeah, but this original, not a remake. Oh, okay. Original? Yeah. I would still say no. You um, think they're going to have Metroid are, are, Prime 4 is, or something? Is it sales numbers now? I feel like this is not like... <laughs> <laughs> we don't play the box office game in the video game industry. That's not a thing we do. <laughs> I, I'm fascinated about it. You know what it is, Kyle? It's um, what? I, I've been busy at GDC and I didn't get a chance to play a lot of these games, so these are the types of questions that I can ask every time I play the game. <laughs> 
<laughs> All I right. Mean, it's it's yeah, I don't know. It's it's interesting because it's like there are certainly new Peach fans after the movie. Um, it is it, what it feels like like a first party Nintendo game. It was developed okay, yeah. by a, a third party, but it's like I, I think it has the potential to be successful. It's it's fun that Peach has her own game. It's a solid game, but, but it's just I don't think it's one that people are going to get really excited about. I'm just saying it's weird that I mean in a year for so many remakes on the Switch, like if Metroid Prime Four isn't going to be launching this holiday season or this fall on the Switch, like this might be 2024's original Nintendo game. Is this game that everybody plays and is like yeah. I guess if you're a dumb kid, it'll be okay. Like it's just yeah. kind of a weird state. Yeah, I. I but I mean, we'll, there there's stuff at the end of the year that we just don't know about yet. Nintendo right. likes to do that lately. Like we're not going to learn about the biggest Switch game of the year until September. Probably. Yes, but the reason that I hesitate about that is the whole rumor that you know the Switch Two was going to launch this year and then they pushed it. Yeah. And so that means like, is that going to be a vacuum? I mean, yeah, I, I, it, it won't feel be. like it yeah. if they're putting the Zelda remasters in that slot, but who knows. Um, all right, Princess Peach Showtime, everybody. Kyle, will you think about this game for the rest of the year? Uh, no, I don't think so. Okay. I feel like I'm being really harsh. On yeah, this you game. are. I don't know I, why like, you it, hate Peach. <laughs> it's like completely fine. Like they yep. they executed on exactly what they wanted this game to be. I think, but it's just sort of it's just a cotton candy game that I played through it and I was like, ah, right, that was all right. And then I moved on to Rise of the Ronin or whatever. You know. Okay, let's keep on Ronin. Um. <laughs> this was the game from Team Ninja. This whole thing. Uh, that's open world. Uh, Kyle, give me a genre. Define Rise of the Ronin for the listeners. A Souls-like. Open world. Open Souls world like. Souls-like. That is the is... Ghost of Tsushima. Is that a genre? Yeah, I think that works. Yeah. Um, <laughs> okay, so we've all just played a little bit of Rise of the Ronin. I actually, I haven't touched it yet, but Ko's brought it by PlayStation. Oh, neither have I. Okay, great. All actually, right, let's talk about the sales numbers. Huber and Kyle haven't either. So yeah, what do you think? Is this I've thing gonna... a little bit. Okay, perfect. Um, yep. Huber. Yeah. First impressions, Rise of the Ronin. How are you feeling about it? There's a little a little context. There is something I okay. First up, I love challenging games. I right. love them. There is something though about Team Ninja games that my brain cannot handle. Interesting. <laughs> oh, yeah. Like th just the way they it, everything just feels overcomplicated in these games. Like. Wolong and, and this and Neo, even Neo one and two, like these are games that I should be obsessed with. I'm yeah. obsessed with like Samurais. I'm obsessed with Souls games. I'm obsessed with Ninja Gaiden and this team. Like, but there's just something about their games that I, I just I fumble my way through. Like I never finish their games because I'm trying to like learn them also. There's so much to learn and wrap my head around. And when then when I finally start doing the thing, like when I start like attacking enemies, hot take, but it just never feels the best. Sure. Yeah. I think there's Rise something the like loose and floaty about like Team Ninja Combat compared to something like Sekiro or, or even Dark Souls. Which is so like weird to say about heavier and weightier and even yeah. Dragon's Dogma. Like, yeah. But it's weird to say about Team Ninja, you know, like that seems like that is their, or was their claim to fame, right? And now when you're saying it just feels a little floatier than most. Yeah. Well, there's also Rise of the Ronin is particularly bad about it, I guess. I have a lot of positive things to say about Rise Same. of the Ronin, by the way. It's awesome, but, but it's just so hard. I'm like, what What am I even doing? <laughs> huh. But it is, it, there is a lot of stuff where it's like, okay, I have the counter system down. I, I like mm -hmm. sneaking around and like coming up behind bad guys and stuff. But, yeah. but I'm like... I don't know, like maybe five hours in or something, maybe six. And it's like, it's still throwing like tutorial messages at me for like really specific things. And where I like, I read it and I'm like, mm -hmm. I'm going to even engage I, with that, but I am worried yeah. that this is going to be important. And it's like 100% kind of same, dude. 100%. All their games, I have that same problem where yeah. it's just like the tutorial and the onboarding is like unclear <laughs> for me. Yeah. I don't know. Um, and I there's just like, so much loot and just so, there's just so much that, in their games. There's too much stuff. That was my question is when you kill a normal like enemy pawn, do they drop 
seven pairs of pants because no. it's like when that that's that's <laughs> why i kind oh, of yeah, like quit neo. neo and stuff yeah. i was just like i no, can't do the bad. loot anymore. I, I i'm not know. a loot guy either jacob and it's not it's i wouldn't this is not a there is loot in the game but it's not a loot heavy game oh hey okay. yeah i mean i watched the ign uh -huh. video review and they're like jesus christ this loot this is stupid how much loot you get it sucks how much loot they give you all the time okay. so I mean, maybe, maybe, maybe i'm just like on. not in that zone yet maybe it hasn't given me those tutorials yet loot but, zone. Uh, i just know it's a little less than neo but it is still just a lot like yeah. the team the team ninja excess yeah. <laughs> even like that. final fantasy origin they were just throwing so much stuff at you even in that <laughs> game it's just that that was like i want to play that game so bad i know a lot of people who are like final fantasy origin is awesome the combat's great and i like get in there and it's like here's seven pairs of pants and i just check out <laughs> i guess i i do consider that a point of reference because i i did the same thing i like i played an hour or two of that game and i was like i don't want to stop every few steps to change out my gear right. where where this, I've really gone into like the menus and really haven't changed stuff out that much. Like I've yeah. I've upgraded my swords once and I changed my shirt once, but maybe that could get worse over the course of the game. But um, on, on to the good stuff. Like, mm -hmm. and this Dragon's Dogma is really good about this too. Um, and this is totally a factor of coming finishing Rebirth and moving on from Rebirth. Where I mean, I I think undeniably like the the sort of way characters move in in rebirth is, is based on the sort of what they established from final fantasy 7 remake where it's like they were kind of forcing characters into an open world setting and it ultimately doesn't feel very good to like clamber over the environment and right stuff there's in, some weird popping of cloud like what i can get over this rock yeah. what is going on yeah and like uh rise of the ronin has just like right out of the gate like right when i entered the open world i was like oh this this feels good to just like run over the fields mm. jump onto roofs and then like the big thing for me and this is like a big thing in a lot of games like uh where where they do it well um you can be sprinting full speed and call your horse and you do not break your love gate. that yeah. like you the horse runs up next to you and you jump on it and you just are going faster and it's like it's that little thing of like the game was designed to be open world from the beginning where they like took that into consideration from the start like and it's like it, it and it's it benefits by me sort of getting annoyed with chocobos <laughs> in rebirth <laughs> where i was like i would call chocobos and you kind of have to like stop and get on them to start riding a chocobo. A little bit. Even that's better than it was in 16. Like 16, you actually have to stop and press the button to get on. And rebirth is just kind I, of. I didn't like do it. the side quest to unlock the chocobo in 16. So what I are you got a doing? <laughs> Jesus wow. Christ! But, uh, all, the, all the other side quests were so rewarding, Kyle. <laughs> hey, come on, man. It was funny because that that I I think I told that to someone and they're like, really? How did you miss that? And I was like, well, Jacob told me I shouldn't do any of the side quests. <laughs> it's like unfortunately there is one you have to do and the rest are garbage. Yeah, that's. What... But uh, but it's those little things where it's just like even if it's even if in the long run because like uh i spoke with imbron khan a fair bit about it who reviewed it for game informer and he says like in the long run the open world stuff uh fumbles and it, it's oh, yeah. kind of it, it's like not the the best but at least like those first couple hours i was like oh this is refreshing i have this horse i can jump on i unlock the glider this feels cool it also in the combat it's like it's one of those like just like a little thing that i'm like oh that's fun is a it, after you finish a combo and defeat an enemy if you press r1 quickly enough yeah. you you flip you like throw the blood off your sword and you get a Ooh. bonus for that like it adds oh really <laughs> yeah like it's like a gameplay mechanic flicking the blood off your sword and i was like that's great like that's oh, that's just good cool. stuff yeah yeah yeah, it's something that's the cool. Stealth is cool. The stealth is really cool too. I love, I love that Tenchu vibe. Like just yeah. giving me the option to kind of clear out some drop. enemies. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And you can like jump in the air and like pull yourself two enemies or pull them to you or get mm -hmm. on. Like there's a lot of stuff that just feels good. And I love historical settings. And I love how detailed a lot of these like glossary entries are. It'll tell you about like the president at the time that's like sending Americans over to Japan. Like there's a lot of stuff to kind of dig into. And it like does a pretty good job of really like getting you in the time and, and yeah. place yeah, of it, where it's going I, on. I had a month. The first proper boss in the game is Matthew Perry. Matthew Perry. I laughed at that. I was like, yeah, it's like Matthew Perry. And I was, this is weird. I was like, oh my gosh, let's go, Chandler. And then I was like, yeah. surely that was not a mistake. And of course, I Googled it and like, I'm an idiot. It's like, yeah, this is like a, this person was like integral <laughs> in like connecting Japan to the West for for trade in, 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 in the 1850s. And I was like, oh, okay, well, I hit him with a sword a bunch of times. <laughs> Do you think, I mean, Matthew Perry probably did 
what do you think, 450 interviews about friends throughout his life? Did a single Jeez. person ask him about the 1800s in Japan and if there's any connection and the family oh, was trying to tie gosh. into that? Maybe during that, him when he was promoting that movie he did with Chris Farley. He did a Chris Farley like movie? Mass, Matthew Perry and yeah. Chris Farley are in a movie. Almost Heroes? Oh, Come on, guys. I've never Everybody seen it. I've never seen it. Heroes. Come on, leave me alone. Jeez. <laughs> yeah, it takes uh, place yeah. in like uh, colonial America. It's like him and Chris Farley. Right, right. Yeah. <laughs> Something um, something that Imran said in his review that I thought was like I was like oh that's a good good thing to read in a review is he was like it, it it's very it's the game is like does not want to get supernatural and so you're just fighting like dudes the whole time yeah. and so Imran was like there are only so many big dudes with two swords that I can fight in this game before <laughs> I'm like here's another big guy with two swords right right yeah uh, I am worried about the longevity of it. Like I, like, I could see it, you know, maybe getting annoying over time because maybe you're doing a lot of the same stuff. But, like, a, a really good first impression, despite what Michael and I are talking about, where it's like, I feel like I'm a little in the weeds here with, like, mechanics mm -hmm. necessarily. But, like, yeah. thinking up behind guys and stabbing them and, like, you know, using the grappling hook to run around. And, like I said, yeah. jumping on your horse, like, while you're sprinting through the field is, like, a good feeling that, I'm, that I'm enjoying. Yeah. Because you dug Wo Long, I think, more than most people. You feel like you're enjoying yeah. Rise of the Ronin more? Out of the gate for that? Mm, good question. I think so. Yeah, I think I like the setting a little more of yeah. of um, Rise of the Ronin, and it is it is very counter heavy. Like that is yeah. the combat is it's all counter. I was just gonna say when you start getting into the rhythm of attack, attack, counter, attack, counter, like that stuff gets really fun, and it feels really responsive too. Yeah. So yeah, I do. I did go look in the menus at the accessibility stuff because I hit a point where I was like. I wouldn't say no to some Arkham style alerts over people's heads, <laughs> honestly. Yeah. Like I think I <laughs> That's still like my favorite the difficulties counter system, actually. Which is nice. Though... Oh, oh, go ahead. Oh, Arkham, Arkham Arkham counters. Oh yeah. The yeah. Best. I mean it's so they project it yes. so overtly that it's like impossible to miss. And like now it's popular to be like, oh, we're not telling you when to counter. And it's like but then if you play but then if you play me, Arkham I don't really on, mind. Uh... <laughs> yeah. If you play Arkham on Professional, though, it like takes him away, which I love. True. There we go. That's cool. But there's difficulties in Rise of the Ronin. I wasn't expecting that. Actually. Oh, that's I don't know interesting. Why. There's like three out of the gate. There's yeah. even like one that says, you know, you want to focus on the story. So if you're like into the setting and you want to dip your feet in, but you're nervous about like how insanely hardcore some Team Ninja games are, yeah, you should probably be okay there. I it do? does. It does seem like lower on the sort of difficulties. Yeah, like I, yeah. I haven't hit as any nearly as many walls as I did in Wo Long. Right. And I, had, and I had a good time with Wo Long, but um, like even bosses, the couple of the handful of bosses I've attempted, at most took me like four tries. Okay. You know, and I wasn't like hitting my head against the wall, which was mm -hmm. nice. Yeah, I, I wonder um what the audience is going to be like for Rise of the Ronin. Like, it feels like there's some overlap there with Dragon's Dogma too. It's wild that. All three of these games so far are releasing on the same day. I hope they don't cannibalize each other. I know there's a lot of Princess Peach fans that might be checking out Rise of the Ronin instead and vice versa. <laughs> no, but it, but it's interesting that Rise of the Ronin, it's also co-op. You know, just to have an open yeah. world, you know, Souls-like, if that co-op thing is going to be compelling for people. But yeah, and, you, and, that, and if you don't have a live person, you usually have an NPC with you that you can switch to. So you basically have like two health bars worth of character to take into like a boss fight and stuff like that oh right? interesting uh which is again helps with the difficulty in a way that i like because it's like it just lets you last longer you know and keep practicing sure. that boss that you're stuck on or something you yeah because like i so often in these games i'll be like well i'm not gonna win this time but i guess i'll keep playing just so i can practice some of the timing mm -hmm. here yeah and that like sort of extends that timeline for you a little bit which is nice uh also gotta give a quick shout out to the timing of this release coinciding with shogun oh yes. okay <laughs> yeah. i'm glad you brought that up yes that show on tv right now it is unbelievable so honestly rise of the ronin coming out right now is just perfect that's, that's well it was scratch that itch i was like because I, I don't know if you guys have watched shogun no, I heard but it's things. like you know <gasps> it, it's 1600s i believe and a big point of like the big plot push of the of it is like a ship from the West comes to Japan and they're trying to figure out what to do with that. What, what is this world we found, which is like a very cool idea. Yeah. And they, I think they even call it like a black ship, 
right? Mm-hmm. Michael? And the first yeah. mission you do in this game, which takes yep. about 200 years later, is yeah. like board the black ship. Yeah. Like, oh, that's, what? Cool. that's so weird that these are like side by side. Mm-hmm. I mean, like historically, they're about 200 years apart, which yeah. I was surprised when I looked that up. But it it is fun to have this show I'm really enjoying. And then also this game, which is kind of in the same zone. I would like yeah. to see, too, like all the comparisons, because it's also the same time that Like a Dragon Ishin is from last right. year, right? So yeah. it's like, I bet they have overlapping ah. characters and stuff. And like, it'd be fun just to see how these two different studios tackle this whole thing. But I thought you were going to say, in terms of timing, Huber, like, I thought it was really weird because this is a, you know, Sony is pushing this game hard. It's a PlayStation 5 exclusive for Rise of the Ronin. But then like two weeks ago, they announced Ghost of Tsushima coming to PC. It's going to yeah. look sweet. And I feel like, did they undercut their own messaging? Yeah, I feel like if you just weird. would have waited until like two weeks after this game came out to talk about that PC version because yeah. I'm hoping that people aren't just going to be like, wow, if I need, uh, you know, ancient Japan, feel Japan, let me just go for Ghost of Tsushima instead. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that is interesting that they would do that. Yeah, it it does, sometimes it's more I'm of always a... just like, what are what are they doing over there? Sometimes with like marketing and stuff. Just I'm like, sure there's a thousand their own reasons. World. Yeah. Maybe <laughs> maybe it's smart because like I love Tsushima, but I don't, I don't want to replay that game even if it's on a new platform. Yeah, but if I am like, oh, I love Tsushima, I'm in the mood for that. Oh, here's a little game called Rise of the Ronin, and right? it's all it's new, play. baby. Yeah. 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 Uh, okay, it's out now, or it's out uh, on Friday for folks. Uh, Rise of the Ronin. There. Um, by the way, Huber, real quick. We can hear you typing, and the oh, sorry. but the messed up thing, we sorry. can hear the keys that you're hitting, and yeah. we know every word you spelled out, and we're frankly <laughs> offended. You're taking notes on how much we suck. <laughs> <laughs> Blood, you wouldn't believe. Jacob Geller doesn't know what the hell he's talking about. <laughs> uh, hey, Jacob. Death. Yeah. The game that I keep forgetting the name of, Death of a Wish. Death of a Wish is the name of this yeah, game. Yeah, I keep confusing it with the Silent Hill 2 expansion, Born from a Wish, which <laughs> is where you played as Maria. Completely different. So, Death of a Wish, uh, it is out now from the developer called Me Less Than Three, of course. It was at Day of the Devs. And the thing is, I don't know if any of you have been lucky enough to be in that situation where, like, there's a ton of indie games playing on a bunch of TVs, like Day of the Devs, which is great. But it really takes an art style to pop out of that crowd. It, it's tough. You don't have that much time with every game. You could spend whole days there uh, if you really wanted to. But at Day of the Devs this year, like Death of a Wish was definitely in the upper tier of just see this game visually and you say, what is going on here? It's an action RPG isometric, but Jacob Geller, it's like it's scratched into pixels. It's like it's drawn with a nail. Like, how do you describe it's the look a, of yeah, this game? It's look like it up. Looking it's it up a now. really, it's like, the the kind of base color is black yeah. and then all the whole art style is just like oh. super scribbly and it it almost reminds me of like the art style of like a really good version of like flash games that i used to play you Ooh, know it's like okay. oh this is this is like fancy pants adventure if it like went to college and got an art degree <laughs> it is it's like that i'm looking at it now it's like that paper that you guys write like it's like black paper that you buy and right yeah and then you can scrape off the black to reveal like rainbow colors underneath yeah. yeah and what's what's kind of crazy about it is like you kind of see i saw that art style and i was like visual novel maybe yes. you know yep. something kind of exploratory and it's like no it plays like hyper light drifter it is a very combat intense game and yet somehow even within that like really kind of abstract art style the enemies are like pretty readable it's like it is also a counter heavy combat yeah. system and i thought like this is gonna be impossible because the characters don't really look like anything but you can still <laughs> see how they're animating like when the attack is coming and you can counter it and so it's like it's a really impressive feat to pull off this art style and this genre simultaneously yeah and they still managed to pack in a lot of weird systems that work out well maybe this has been done in other games but i was surprised but like early on the teacher had a teleport like okay there's gonna be a kind of pillars if you hit a you can teleport to it and i was like Okay, this seems like a fine navigational thing, sure. I was like, oh, no, no, this is in the middle of combat. There's just, like, these pillars around the arena that if you hit Hmm. A at any point, there's also, like, a dodge roll. Then if you hit A, then you're just teleporting and warping to these different spots in the arena as you're fighting these guys. It's a surprisingly action-packed thing. Even within its art style, the game is then doing, like, flashes of, like, Yes. other things like it's it's really kind of honestly it's like probably a very seizure warning game because yeah. it's like dark and there's a lot of flashing things but like there's 
when you finish a combat encounter, it does the kind of thing that like Devil May Cry or Bayonetta does where you do a little animation to like get rid of the barrier. Yeah. And it's like the animation is then this like hand drawn character who goes like and kind of gives like a finger gun to the camera. <laughs> so and good. it like is really kind of sudden and jarring, but looks so cool. Um, and Ben, I feel like you've buried the lead for you here, which yeah. is the main character looks like Cloud Strife. And oh, I assume sure. that's mainly why you like yeah, it. Yeah, 10 out of 10. Uh, no regrets on that front, for sure. I, <laughs> I really thought when you said, uh, you know, what I'm going to be interested in, I love that there's a taunt button. Like, on the D-pad, like, Smash Brothers style. It's fun to have, like, an action Love RPG that. single player, but, like, oh, you can still taunt uh, if you want to. Bro, you have just a, a confident Bayonetta. moment. Yeah. It's 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 pretty sweet. Um, it um, did... It, and then the, the game is about, like, destroying uh, Christianity. Yes! Seems. Or at least, like, organized right. religion. The, the tone of it... I'm curious if it's working for you, Jacob, because there are times where, like, okay, it's not voiced, but it feels like it has some similar vibes of, like, an El Paso elsewhere, just heavy mm. on tone above all else. Like, you know, the text on the screen says, my nerves scream out with every fiber of my being. And then there's a little prompt and then you select the option that says, open my eyes. And it goes, open my eyes! And it, like, flashes on the screen. It's, a, it's very... Confident, cool text, but is the, is the world and the story working for you on the front? Yeah, I think I kind of have to... I want to finish it before judging. Like, I think this is right on the edge of kind of too edgy for its own good yes. or really interesting. <laughs> and I just won't know until I see, like, where the game is going. But, right. like, it's not it's not bad. You know, it's like the story is is interesting it's just like when especially when you're kind of playing with these themes of kind of religious oppression and whatever it's just like i don't want it to be too cliche uh right. with mm. with those ideas but like i'm i'm invested you know i want to i really want to keep playing it yeah i had a weird moment early on in the game because like right when you boot it up it's like okay enter the name of somebody who's the most important to you enter the name of somebody who you would die for and I was like starting to type in like my wife's name. And I was like, wait, no, indie game. You don't deserve this. I'm not going to just give you my family members' <laughs> names. So I'm just going to put in the word pizza and then see where it goes, earthbound style. <laughs> I'd probably die for a pizza. That's fine. But yeah, Death of a Wish. It, at least uh, it, it seems great. But look up uh, just gameplay footage of it. It's worth seeing this thing in action. Like it, it's rare to gasp at a pause screen. But this is one of them too. It's like, I just have never <laughs> seen a layout like this before. It's just so wild looking. But Death of a Wish is the name of that thing. Um, it's a good title. Yeah, solid. Um, another game that I played uh, a little bit uh, on the flight back from GDC is, it's one of those games where I saw it for a second and I said, yes, I want this. Um, it's called Boar Blasters. Um, like the animal? Uh, no, like boring in... Um, okay. to an animal. Uh, but the developer's <laughs> name is 8-Bit Skull. Uh, it, it, the easy pitch is it's like Vampire Survivors if you were mining, kind of combining uh, all of that stuff. But what drew me to it specifically is, I mean, you're a helicopter trying to get deeper and deeper in different caverns, oh, uh, unlocking really different good. things. That it sounds is, really yep. fun, You dude. see a second of that game it called? Play. It's called Boar Blasters. Boar Blasters. Yeah. But it caught me because... God, what was it? Two years ago, um, Dome Keeper completely rocked my world. Huber, have you ever played Dome Keeper? I didn't know. What it's are you so, talking it about? It is so freaking good. It's one of those games that like I found in late December after we did our goatee discussions. Like, God, Dome Keeper would have been really high on my list. That's another game all about kind of mining and kind of tower defense, yada, yada, yada. And Boar Blasters, no offense to Boar Blasters, it kind of just feels like a dumber version of that. Like, there's no tower defense. You're just in a helicopter trying to mine as deep as you can to get different upgrades and get di this like build up the currencies fun, to upgrade your abilities and all the helicopters. And you get, like, special abilities. Like, you can just, every once in a while, just charge through these uh, rock walls as the helicopters are going through and trying to take on enemies. But... If you like Vampire is it Survivors, challenging? it is. Uh, it's it's this, definitely okay. getting there. Yeah, but of course, you know, I, you know, there's upgrades that are going to make it quite a bit easier. Like improve your health, improve your gas mileage in the helicopter, improve your rate of fire, and all that stuff. So the more you play it, and even if you fail, you get like you build up the currencies. So it's just going to get smoother and smoother. But it's it's honestly the perfect exercise game, Kyle. If you need something new on your Steam Deck and you like to watch a bunch of numbers pop off as you that try and do so fun, dude. Have, stuff. I've been playing uh, Prince of Persia like 
30, 20, 30 minutes at a time. Yeah. <laughs> or the fast. That's why I've been nice. my exercise game. I'm almost done with that, though. I'm very close. Yeah. Oh, somebody watched it. Shout out to uh, SteamWorld Dig, uh, Ben. Do you like yeah. uh, your SteamWorld Dig oh, fan? I've never good. gotten into it, and I know I'm blowing oh. it. I know. I need to try more. I'll try harder. Yeah. One is cool. Two is incredible. Uh, Backlog... Also, like, what's the tactics one called? Uh, SteamWorld, SteamWorld Heist. Heist? Yeah. That one's yeah. fun. Um, yeah, somebody, Backlog Busters in the chat asks, if anyone's played Deep Rock uh, Survivor, um, honestly, I had it downloaded on my Steam Deck, and then I booted up Boar Blasters instead. But I, I definitely want to give it a whirl at some point here. Wait, it seems was that the Deep Rock Galactic? Was that the? Yeah. It's the Vampire Deep Survivors Rock? take from the Deep Rock Whoa. Galactic team. Oh, yeah. okay. Ooh. That's super cool. Uh, Dang. Hey, Jacob Gather, you're moving in slow motion. Um, but as oh. you're moving in slow motion, just to make it more cinematic, uh, looks cool. <laughs> you wrote, you wrote a damn book. I'm I'm writing a book, Ben. I've still got to write a lot of it. Is that right? I assumed uh, there was a I done saw the be. videos and they had pictures of like a completed book. Yeah, that seems like you would not be amazed that you can do these days. <laughs> um, right? No, I'm 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 writing a book. Um, ben, you asked me like three months ago. You were like, Jay, have you ever think you'll ever write a book? And like this process from from starting talking to the publisher to getting them out the door yeah. took like six months so i was like well on my way and just had to kind of play it chill <laughs> yeah on that. that was that was when we had brandon jones uh formerly vz allies on talking about his book and then yeah who would have known that you were secretly typing away like a fiend over there working on your own stuff <laughs> okay jacob you're moving to slow motion and we're live do you want to just can, drop out and I jump back in switch i think i can switch my camera source which will probably fix That'll it because i'm it. trying to Make it do something fancy, but I can just have it be the normal. Oh, because you're doing That's the depth of dramatic. field nonsense in the background. No, no need when you're talking about a book. Just go pure and simple. Kyle, you ever want to write simple another book? And clean. <laughs> oh, I want to talk to you about something. I uh, sure. Yeah, book. You, Kyle, just answer the question. Would you ever write another book? Yeah, 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 yeah. I've okay, got I'm one here. that like I've started. You know. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Is it uh, fiction? Yeah. Oh, interesting. Um, okay, I'm back. Oh, yeah. I, I have a cat. Jacob, with me please, now. you missed your window. We're talking to Kyle about his book. Uh, and also, <laughs> we're Hubert. talking to Kyle about a book that he doesn't want to talk about yet. Uh, Hubert, I got a GDC story for you. Um, yeah. So I was uh, in the hotel waiting to go up for like the Nintendo preview appointment, all that stuff. And I ran yeah. into a uh, uh, friend of the show, Alex Ansel, who um, we had on talking about uh, Resident Evil in the past. I think, yeah, he's on, I think, talking about Resident Evil 3 remake. Uh, back when we covered nice. that on this podcast and stuff. Anyways, he was like, hey, good to see you, good to see you. Um, and yell, sorry, not Incel. But uh, he's like, hey, you might want to stick around for a bit because there's going to be somebody coming down off those elevators pretty soon you're going to want to meet. I was like, what is this? I'm so excited for this stupid tease. And then the elevator door is open and it's Yoko Shimamura, the Kingdom Hearts composer. No, nice. yeah. so and I was so excited. Goodness. It was so sweet. And like I interviewed her, oh. I interviewed her in Japan for the Final Fantasy 15 trip for Game Informer. Yeah. Um, so I had like a little bit of an end to be like, oh, I met you back in the day. We talked about Final Fantasy 15, and she felt so bad that she didn't remember me. I'm like, are you kidding me? Like the composer <laughs> of Street Fighter 2, Super Mario RPG, most important, <laughs> yeah. Martin Rabbits, uh, most recently, like just an incredible library of compositions. And she was very yeah. sweet. And then she won uh, a damn award at GDC, like the Lifetime Achievement Award. So it's kind of that. her That's big so cool. week. Yeah, very well deserved. Uh, just like Jacob Geller's success for his book so far. Thank you. <laughs> Glad we can have that anecdote in the middle. Um, okay, so the book is called How a Game Lives, and it is um, kind of a collection of the essays that I've written over my YouTube career. Everyone's favorite. We've got Fear of Cold, Who's Afraid of Modern Art, uh, The Legacy of the Haunted House, lots of essays in there. Um, but, and Ben, I'm wondering if this is a touch point to you. Did uh -oh. you ever read the Farside Collection, The Prehistory of the Farside? I saw that in your video for that being a main point of reference for you. And it's like, I would have died for that behind the scenes look at Farside as a kid. I was just a goober with like the huge, you know, page a day calendar for Farside. Like that's how I consume right. most Farside content. Yeah. No, and it's like I read I read, you know, like a million books of like collected newspaper comics when I was a kid. But that yeah. was always my favorite because it had like Gary Larson's notes on like 
I wrote this comic because, uh, I don't know, this this guy reminded me of a kid that I knew in high school. He's a senator now. And it was like a you know comic about like a monkey being in class with a bunch of cavemen. And so I was like, okay, that's funny. But it, but it was just kind of like, oh, there's a, you know, here, here are the thoughts of the person who created the stuff that I like uh, in the book. And so that's kind of... That's kind of the strategy that I'm taking here where yeah. like I'm returning to those essays and I am just like filling we literally had to like redo how the pages were laid out because I'm just filling the margins with a million little notes on like everything from kind of like here's research that didn't make it in or like here's something that's happened since this essay came out that is it would have changed how I phrased this or right, whatever. Right. Um and so that's there's a bunch of new writing from me. But then there's also new writing from a bunch of other people because I I wanted there to be like a lot of fully original stuff in here. So yeah. a, a kind of an astounding assortment of writers who have for some reason agreed to be in this <laughs> uh, award winning novelists Jamil Jan Kochai and Nana Kwame Ajay Brenya are in it. Uh, Chris Plant of uh, Polygon. Uh, yes, Ben. Do you pay them? Yeah. That's it. Okay. I was just curious. <laughs> I'm sure you reach out just, hey, what you're up for doing this, then you, then you pay me as well. But I'm just curious about that idea of, like, writing in somebody else's book. Like, how does that work? I'm so confused well, about this whole process. It's like I am, I am like, commissioning them to do an essay, more right. or less. Okay. Or, you know, so it's, it's like I don't – I actually don't know what – how, like, forwards for books usually work. Right. Um, I'm paying the writer of my forward because he's writing – words for me and that's work sure. you know like i i just kind of feel like you should but i don't know how these things usually work um but there are going to be a bunch of just like original essays that are kind of based on my essay but just taking them in like weird different directions and we're not putting too many rules on it so i'm really excited to see kind of like the variety of different things that writers do that given cool. these basic prompts yeah, that's awesome. Um, and I saw something about Lost in Cult. Is that the Lost in Cult. Yes. Thank you. So I sorry, I'm not cool enough to be more familiar with them. I know I'm I'm blowing it. Um, but they had some messaging of like this book is the best selling book since the New Testament. What, what was their messaging? <laughs> uh, yeah, it's it was the most the most successfully funded book uh they've ever done Jesus. in the first like six hours. Jesus like, Christ! It, it, Congratulations! It, 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 like the you know the Citizen Sleeper books and the Immortality ones, which are incredibly cool, and people should check those out. Wait, there's yeah. a Citizen Sleeper book. Yeah, it's like it's a it's an art book, and it's got a bunch of writing from uh, from Gareth, and who's also going to Do be I writing an that. essay for my book. So if you like Gareth Damian Martin, the creator of Citizen Sleeper, check out my books. <laughs> yeah, I, that gross. is one. Of, that was one of my favorite games that year. Well, of course. Yeah. I mean, because Jacob liked it, so it's obvious yeah, one more and over. Like that, <laughs> There's no surprise here. Uh, well, congrats, Jacob. Does it? It must feel good. I'd imagine. How does this feeling, having a successful book, getting out of the gate here, compare to like a video exploding on YouTube? I. It's really. What does success feel like, Jacob Geller? <laughs> I, yeah, let us all know. <laughs> what What I love about the book is like how many people are involved in it it's like i don't really collaborate with many people on my videos like it's it's usually yeah. just me and like maybe a, an extra editor that i've hired or something but it's like this like having like everyone at the publisher is excited and like the you know the designer of the book who i'm working really closely with is like thrilled and so like all of these people being excited and all of them i think are like incredibly talented uh is like it is really cool to kind of share in that uh that hype yeah, totally. It, it, the art design for the cover, I mean, that perfect. was a, it's ridiculously yeah. compelling. It, it, it's one of my favorite working artists, Killing an Ang, and it was like one of the first things that I said when I was meeting with Lost and Cold. I was like, "Do you think we could get this guy?" And they were like, "Kind of a big swing, but like, let's try." And uh, and and then he said yes, uh, and so I have just like a <laughs> staggeringly cool cover. That's awesome. And the name of the book one more time is? The book is called How a Game Lives, and you can get it from Lost in Colts website. That's sweet. One place. Is that a How Do You Live reference or just coincidence? Uh, it, it, coincidence. Chris Plant did say The Game and the Heron immediately when I told him <laughs> the name of it. But no, I mean, I, I, 
I just think it's a cool. It's a good title. Like it, it is a really yeah. good title. Nailed it. Uh, and when's it coming out? Uh, quarter four, 2024. I don't know how long it takes to like produce a book after all the writing and art and stuff is done. Right, but right. It'll be it'll be out by the end of this year, hopefully. Sweet. Uh, hey, Kyle, do you know how this whole thing operates? This whole MinMax thing. Same way, however, books come together. We think we don't know how any of it works. <laughs> One page at a time. I did want to. An early potential name for MinMax is I was thinking pages per second, which is a terrible name in retrospect, but that was an idea of like, oh, to tie into like the yes. magazine past. I like it. You got something there. That you're, that's a kernel of something there. That was as far as it went, and then it was immediately killed. Yeah. Um, no, Kyle, don't be a fool. Uh, this whole thing is brought to you by Patreon. Patreon.com ah. slash MinMax with two N's. You go there, find the tier that's right for you, find something sustainable over time, and that keeps us as an independent outlet sustainable on our end. Uh, again, you can unlock Bonus Pod, which is our Patreon-exclusive podcast. There's going to be a very fun episode coming up on Monday where we break down all things GDC. There's a lot of... If you like kind of the game industry behind-the-scenes stuff, there's going to be a, a good deep dive into that right there. Not to mention that bonus podcast feed is where you can unlock the deepest dive on Final Fantasy VII Rebirth. Uh, we're going to be covering chapters 9 through 11 on next week's episode, which will be up early in the week in that bonus podcast mm. feed for your convenience, everybody. Um, Exciting. But uh, let's see. You all know I am 8-Bit? Yes. Yes. Uh, you know how cool they are overall? Very Tell us. Yeah, they're, they're fantastic. Um, they forgot to update the sheet because uh, they're busy with Day of the Devs and what we should be promoting. But Day of the Devs I went to and it was freaking sweet. So if everyone could just do me a favor and just go to im8bit.com and we can just help relay like what's cool in their store right now. Um, on the landing page, vinyl album for Vampire Survivors. Uh, it doesn't get better than that. Game Maker Sketchbook. Ooh, Outer Wilds collection. Jacob Keller, are you seen this Outer Wilds thing from im8bit? That, that Outer Wilds collection is crazy i have i have their vinyl which like sold out immediately but they're they're reprinting it and they're they've got an art book which i'm absolutely gonna buy yeah and like a they weird. have a they have psychonauts plushes which i'm genuinely i want to get one of those that oh, is nice Raz plush hell yeah field guide to outer wilds that is a ridiculous thing oh i'm very excited about this uh they have the animaniac soundtrack on vinyl Animaniacs. So good. Like that soundtrack You'll was never so forget important. the countries again. I know. Oh my god. States and capitals. Like that'll Andrew, be. They might be in. Giants fan, inexplicably. It's the place to be. So check out I Yo, Apids. Sayonara Wild Hearts sticker pack. Shout out. Done. Truly Dude. one of the coolest stores online if you're a gamer. So check out I am Apids wonderful online store. As always, you can use the promo code to get 10% off everything in that store. Uh this month, the promo code is Thin Mints. Thin mints, no space. So you can check that out. Uh, help support I Am 8 Bit because they support the MinMax community and MinMax in general each and every week by shipping out a prize from their wonderful online store to whoever has the best question submitted over there on Patreon. So if you support us at any tier on Patreon, even that $2 tier, uh, and you can submit a question. We choose our number one favorite question, and somebody wins a prize then, thanks to I Am 8 Bit. And that prize this week is Grim Fandango on Switch. I, I would like nice. to win that prize. I don't have that game on Switch. And it's one of my favorites, but I would love to have that. Um, okay. Shout out to I made bit. Thank you so much. You ready for community questions here? Yes. Great. Lock it in. Dan from Canada. So, you know, he's going to be a troublemaker. He writes in and <laughs> says, do you think we've played the game of the decade or is it still yet to come? Now I should remind everybody it is 2024. Yeah. It's next year. Next year is when the game of the decade is coming. Yeah, GTA 6. <laughs> oh, buddy. <laughs> okay, was GTA yep. 5 your game of the generation, last generation? Red Dead 2. Or I guess two generations ago? Red Dead 2 is the GOAT. Okay, okay, I guess that's yeah. confusing. Okay, right? when you say that, because I was like, where does the 10-year sort of period, but we're talking about like 2020 to 2030. Right? Yeah, 2020 okay. to 2029. So they, so Dan okay. from Canada reminds okay. us that on an episode of the podcast before, we went through the decades, and MinMax's official stance is that Breath of the Wild was the game of the decade from 2010 to 2019. And, no, very smart. and 2000 to 2009, I remember it was a big debate, but we landed on Metal Gear Solid 3, <laughs> Snake Eater for that for that window. Snake so hey, we, Okay, so GTA 6 is going to be it for Hubert. Yeah. It, there's, yep. I'm always optimistic about the future of games, but I feel like for the rest of this decade, over the next six years, like can something top... A Baldur's Gate three can it top an Elden GTA Ring? GTA six. Yeah, I just don't think there's anything out <laughs> there that can top about? like an Elden Dude, Ring. Dude, right. 
Rockstar <laughs> games, like like any G- GTA is an event like no other. Like yeah, I, Red I Dead agree, GTA. I... These are games that like anytime one of those comes out, it's a game from like five years in the future. They're like reaching back through time <laughs> to give us this game <laughs> that is so ahead of what a- anything. I what can you shed light on? what it's going to be like when you get your hands on GTA 6 for the first time because you're you're leave. known for your hype. I get that <laughs> idea. You said when we were in LA and you said on the Easy Allies podcast that what you how many times have you rewatched the GTA 6 trailer do you think total? I was watching it every night for mo- <laughs> like months. This <laughs> like, is this is Kojima with a Furiosa <laughs> trailer. It's just like <laughs> I've watched it 80 times yeah. it gets better. <laughs> please, please, please. I mean, yeah. what, are you going to be physically shaking when you're touching that game for the first time? What what do you think you're going to be like just mental headspace jumping into GTA 6? I'm just going to be like like that's peak happiness right there. Yeah. <laughs> that is like why well, Jacob shared up in the morning with us. Can you tell us what that is like? Be happy. <laughs> Someday you'll figure it out, Kyle. Finish that second <laughs> book. You'll figure it out, buddy. Okay, so Huber, uh, Last of Us Part Two. I'm trying to think that yeah. would count. Twenty twenty. Hundred percent, that would count. Okay, is that right now your game of the decade? Such a hard question. I know dude. that's what you're here Dang. for. Dang. Yeah. I gotta see. Like <laughs> it's all this. Just... This is a cop out, but I got to see like Last of Us Part Three for what? Last of Us Part Two to maybe be the game. You know, okay. I feel like, yeah. God, the sad thing is, my first instinct is like, well, that's not going to be out this decade. Yeah, like, there's a chance it won't be right. Like, even though they say they're starting to work on it, definitely. That's a weird idea. Yeah, Jacob, have we hit it? Or are we still going to be fishing for the game of the decade? I, I think for a lot of people it is going to be Baldur's Gate three. Yeah. I don't think I don't think there is going to be a game that does what Baldur's Gate three is doing better. I think like, that's right. Before that, and so it's like you know I I still have not played it. There are a lot of people for whom that game is like not their cup of tea. But like I think for fans of that game, it's going to be the best version of what it is for a pretty long time. Especially did you see the news from GDC? That Larry got out there and said, like, we're not going to make Baldur's Gate 4. We're not making any expansions, not making any DLC. Like, basically, the rules. Well, it, it's an interesting take. Of this, like, they want to disconnect from the licensed D&D world. And when you, you know, put that next to, like, EA, who recently said, we're going to shift away from those licensed properties. We don't really like paying those fees. We kind of want to own our own stuff. It's interesting to hear even Larry and be like, I know, we just made the game of the decade, but... No Baldur's Gate 4. Moving on. Like, I'm so curious if they just take all that and go back to Divinity or if they make something completely new. Like, it's as somebody who's not uh, super passionate about Baldur's Gate 3, it's exciting to hear of them just going in a completely new direction for what they're working on next. Yeah. I mean, the license of that game isn't necessarily what people love so much. It was just the choice-driven nature of the game, right? It's like they could do that with another franchise of their own creation. Yeah, I think they definitely could, yeah. yeah. I mean, uh, Elden Ring, I think, is the one to unseat for me. I think yeah. that that's at the top. I think Tears of the Kingdom is right below it. But it and does then- Elden, King like- was, Elden King is so important because it really broke down that barrier for a lot of people to jump into a Souls game and a, and a FromSoft game. Because with like Dark Souls and Bloodborne and stuff, it was like, okay, you can go like two ways and both ways have a really hard boss and you got to beat that boss if you want to get further like so people would just like die on this, these bosses over and over but elden ring being open world really helped people just like that way is too hard i'm going that way that way is too hard i'm going that way okay i'm just gonna level up a bunch and then go back like just the format of it i think yeah. was so accessible sure. without losing any of that from magic and that that hardcoreness yeah i just think they're gonna Elden Ring 2 is going to come out before 2029 and it <laughs> might be better. You know, it's like yeah. From is going to release more games I mean, this generation. That is true. That DLC is $40. That's probably Elden Ring 2. <laughs> Elden Ring 1.5 for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Or 1.8 or 9, yeah. you know. Uh, Tan right Where is Bloodborne 2, damn it? <laughs> I don't know. Where I mean, is it? That's also a weird case too of it's like Lies know, of P. God, I love Lies of P. <laughs> I can't Easy. So you and Jacob need to get a room if you keep this type of stuff up. You can't you can't keep talking like this, Huber. Uh, Tan writes in and says, why don't we see more reports of Final Fantasy fatigue? If we include remasters and re-releases, since 2020, there have been at least a dozen Final Fantasy games released. 
Why do you think that the franchise doesn't suffer from the same discourse of oversaturation that Assassin's Creed and Call of Duty did? Because it's inconsistent. Yeah, they're all completely it's, different. No, no, I don't mean that. I mean they release oh. them consistently. Yeah. I, you know? Like, it's oh. not that every November we get a new Final Fantasy game. Sometimes it's February. Sometimes it's October. <laughs> Plus, like, the, the remaster thing, I think, is... It. The remake and remaster, that's huge, you know? It doesn't yeah. feel like, hey... It's a different vibe. Yeah. It's like Resident Evil, because, like, there's so many Resident Evil games all the time, but having remakes and newer entries, it's just, even though it's a lot of Resident Evil, it's still super... They're so different from one another. Whereas yeah, I mean, it's it, like next Assassin's Creed, next Assassin's Creed, next next Call yeah. of Duty, next Call of Duty. So. Yeah, even more so. I mean, uh, like Resident Evil, which I love, is still about a guy with a gun shooting <laughs> zombies or werewolves or, like some or whatever. Of them are third person, some of them are first person. Some yeah, but it's co-op. like you know, compared to it's like Final Fantasy. Literally, the only consistency is like there's a name and they they have good music. <laughs> it's like it's like you know graphical style gameplay style story characters like they're it's it's just it's just like a label you know it's like getting mad at like a label for releasing a bunch of records that all have kind of similar tones yeah yeah i hate to take shots but it's also quality you know i know people can be critical of like final fantasy games but I feel for like for a long time, Assassin's Creed has just kind of lost its way, lost its identity. It went to like the huge, huge open worlds with Origins, and when you when you stack up Origins, Odyssey, and Valhalla, all within you know a five year period, that's just that's so fatiguing. That's yeah. so much. What about this, Huber? Imagine this scenario: you're sitting around doing a reaction stream, Easy Allies, uh, the first trailer for remake part three pops up right yeah okay. screaming screaming of course jumping up and down on the desk turning into a gorilla uh throwing your feces <laughs> at the wall whatever the hell you do over there at easy allies all right pops up the big name for what they're going to call this next game we've had remake rebirth what about this it goes final fantasy 7 then it fades in and part three is called teen and then teen? Final Fantasy 17. 17, and it's combining. <laughs> Final Fantasy 17 is technically part three of the remake as well. Just in the world, it's not impossible for Square to do something oh that's stupid. God. I'm just throwing it out there. What if? What if? I think it's like Roman numeral, and then it says, it says teen, and then yeah. they're like, they'll scratch it out, and they're like 17. Or like, no, I would so put funny. the odds at 4%. I would say it's not impossible for something that stupid and confusing to happen. I have a feeling I know what it's going to be called because they say something so much in Ooh, yeah, part yeah. two. I, I have a big now, feeling. I, I haven't finished part two, but I'm going to throw out there. I mean, Crisis Core Reunion was the name of that thing, so that's already yeah. claimed. Okay. but also, that's, that's, a, that's a good name for the last of a trilogy. Okay. Interesting. Uh, Ryan McGinnis writes in and says, Howdy dudes and mystery guest. I was trying to keep you a surprise, Hebrew, but it was you. Um, they say, I saw that promo code for I'm 8-Bit is Thin Mints this time. Do you find it strange that I'm 8-Bit would put the code as the third best Girl Scout cookie? Why wouldn't they make it Samoa's, which is, as we all know, the best Girl Scout cookie? Well, obviously, they're not called Samoa's anymore, dude. Oh, really? What are they called? They changed the names. They're called yeah. Caramel Delights because I think yeah. Samoa's is kind of referencing, like, you know, Native American whatever. Well, not Native American. Pacific Islander. Oh, right. Oh, it's like they were changed. I was a Boy Scout, so all of our stuff was appropriating Native Americans. And so uh, I, I just see, assumed I that's what Scouts do. <laughs> no, no. They used to be called Tagalongs. Now they're peanut butter patties or whatever, right? What, what about this uh, hot thought? I love Thin Mints. It's my favorite. I do feel like you keep Thin Mints in the freezer, double Absolutely. the quality. Double is good. Yep. I go half and half. Is that a hot take? I do one sleeve in the freezer, Ooh. one sleeve normal. Is Huber, that... you're wild. This kitty's got <laughs> claws. Whoa. <laughs> I love, and I love the peanut butter ones, tagalongs, peanut butter patties, whatever you want to call them. It's Those are top two. It's tough. If I had to choose one, it's so tough. I think they balance each other out really well. It was it was really hard for me as a, as a kid because I loved the... Uh, formerly known as Samoas, uh, but you get like eight of them, you know? And it's yeah. like, it's like, okay, I'm going to buy a pack of cookies. I don't have that much money as a kid. I can get 40 Thin Mints. Or like totally, eight totally. Eight Samoas. <laughs> You're so right, dude. Cost-effective Thin Mints. <laughs> Kyle, where are you at? Are you choosing some Haymaker? 
Uh, no, I mean, there's new new ones and stuff that I haven't tried. I kind I I would have said, what are the Caramel Delights now is what they are, right, I think? Yeah. Like, that probably would have been it. But I had a point, I, was, I don't know, it was like 22 or something, where I was like, I have some disposable income now. I'm going to buy, like, a year's worth of these. And I, like, <laughs> really burned myself out on them over the course of, like, Dang. two months. Um, so now I'm like less inclined to, to eat those as, as, as often, but they're probably still my favorite. I'd have to look at the new what's available these days. They have like a new lemon glazed one. That's pretty solid. Okay, Ooh, okay. I do like the lemon ones in general. I do. They've I got wanna... like your standard shortbread one. Mm, get those uh, out of I, here. I, I want to get in front of this before we get corrected 1 million times in the comments. <laughs> Apparently there are different companies that own girl scout cookies and so regionally i think they are still known as samoas oh really in oh, some places and uh the the peanut butter sandwiches are dozy does they still see does my what, dad's favorite yeah they still have tag along so all of these still exist interesting in some places but apparently not in north huh. carolina because the ones i'm buying aren't called those anymore same with same with california they're not they're, they don't have the cool names anymore uh Kyle, tag alongs. Those are my favorite. That's a good name for it. Uh, speaking of burning out on candy, like there's a lot of things I miss about the old Game Informer office. But number one was like around this time, Easter time, Kyle would bring in just bag. Oh, exactly, the star <laughs> Starburst jelly beans. Yes. Like enough and to kill and a man. Sweet tart jelly beans. Sweet tart yeah. Jelly beans are the best. It was a really good move uh, to make it so you were never fired. Um, except for that, except for that one oh, time. If only that had worked. <laughs> you should have brought in more candy, dude. Um, the Juan one wrote in and says, or they ask, what is the vibe of GDC this year with game developers? Most importantly, what is the new scam from companies this year? From NFTs to crypto, what is the new thing companies are trying to sell now? How dare you be so cynical, Juan? Um, yeah, it's AI. We all know what it is. Yeah, it's a lot. It's a lot of AI, and I thought it was really interesting. They have like the show floor of GDC, and they had this huge space. Um, that a company took up with a huge banner that says Web3 sucks. And <laughs> I even, I even got good. like I even got like an email that's like, hey, do you want to come to the Web3 sucks party slash mixer? Dude, like, that what? is some like Nintendo Sega 1990s. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but what if I told you that the twist was it's a Web3 company that's doing this and that's their hook <laughs> is they say uh, Web3 nah, sucks, but we're trying yeah. to make it good. So it's it's We're not like other NFT companies. We're cool. But honestly, there's a lot of people on social media, right? Like sharing that. I mean, I guess I just saw Tamor Hussein from GameSpot doing it, but I was like, they got him. They they got him to share that <laughs> banner everywhere. Uh, so it's like, yeah, it's like you know, Sega does what Nintendo don't. If that was also an ad for Nintendo, <laughs> it's like, <laughs> you know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's see. Michael Tucker writes in and says, Hello, MinMaxers. After eight years of re-downloading, raging, and deleting the game, I have finally acquired Titanfall 2's Platinum Trophy. The wow. final trophy I needed required completing a time trial, trial that required precise moment with little room for error. M movement, I presume they mean. Um, is there a challenge in a game that you love that has eluded you? Have you ever gone back years later to try and complete it? Um... <laughs> Not a specific challenge, just beating the game. I never will. Darkest Dungeon 2. I will Ooh, never beat this game. Really? I stream this game still all the time, like every couple weeks or every month or so. I stream another run. I'm on Act 2 out of 5, and I'm like 70 hours into this game. <laughs> I, will never be, I will never beat it. I will never beat this game. It's just that big, <laughs> that hard. No, it's Im it's impossible, dude. <laughs> it is so impossible. I don't know how anyone can beat Darkest Dungeon Two. It's the hardest game I've ever played. I'll never beat. <laughs> That's bizarre. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I was just talking I about mean, this one. I I've never had like specific challenges, but like <laughs> going back and playing like the Game Boy games that I just thought were impossible when I was like twelve. Right. And just like breezing through them today is is very satisfying. Like Mario Land two six golden coins, you know, oh, like yeah, beating yeah. that game was just this like colossal effort for my brother mm -hmm. and I over the course of what felt like years. <laughs> but it's like I I got the Switch version and I like you you can beat that game in like less than two hours. <laughs> like, it's so, so funny. I yeah. do. I have that in the back of my mind all the time because I think back to like the Game Gear and all those games that I loved on that and it was like somehow I got through Echo on the Game Gear but I remember those puzzles being tough and I remember being stuck on puzzles in Garfield caught in the act 
And I wonder if I go back now to Garfield caught in the act on Game Gear and be like, I was stuck on this puzzle. That's this is the so yeah. most baby New game. New Show ever. Plus, yeah. I, I do feel like it's been in there before, but I would love to put it in yeah. there again. Ben, dude, that reminds me of like on Sega, I had Beavis and Butthead. Yes. And you had to collect the Guar tickets. They like the whole point of the game was like the gore tickets got ripped up and you had to get all the pieces to put them back together. Perfect. And there was there was one final piece like on the principal's head. Never knew how to get it. Oh, <laughs> never, I never knew how to get it. Yeah, it was like I don't know what to do. Did you ever I go bet back? If I went back now, it'd be so easy. <laughs> I don't know. Games were pretty bad back then. It's subjective. Yeah. Um, Philly Eatstick writes in. They say I know this shouldn't bother me, but recently Haley McLean said both twenty seven hours and 27 days later when talking about movies. <laughs> also, Ben Hansen recently on an episode said 128 hours. So just to be clear, the movies are 127 hours, hours, 28 days later, 27 dresses, and 48 hours. These are and 28 weeks. 28 <laughs> weeks later, and now 28 years later, they're working on oh, 28 yeah. weeks. 28 weeks is a movie with Sandra Bullock, right? Oh, right. And then 28 yeah. weeks later is the... <laughs> Okay. Uh, 47 Ronin, 12 Angry Men, <laughs> three billboards outside of Teen Assassins. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Well, I did like a, a saw an interview with Tim Burton where he said that he wanted to call Beetlejuice 2 Beetlejuice 2024 AD. It's like, that is a pretty good name. I, Beetlejuice, I, Beetlejuice yeah. is a great name too. But. I know. I was going to say, I love the. When, I, when they were like, here's the name, I was like, you guys did it. Yep. You're, you did it. <laughs> That's a perfect name. <laughs> yep. I'm worried about the movie, but the name yeah, did oh, it. Yeah, of course. Yeah, no doubt about it. Uh, which reminds me, uh, Chris Fennessy writes in. And they say, this week, X-Men 97 is coming out. It's the sequel to the 90s X-Men animated series, which was a formative show for my childhood. What was your favorite show as a kid? And what would you like to see? What would you like to see if it was continued? My favorite show as a kid was uh, Cyber Chase on PBS, yes. where a bunch of kids uh, went into a computer and fought a green guy named Hacker. Yeah. So uh, I think awesome. I'd just like to see exactly that with no changes or updates to fit the current day. The uh, the programmer for Oregon Trail, the original, he was a consultant on Cyber Chase. No oh, hey. cool. <laughs> Yeah, Lord, for your dude. deep cut, yeah. Oh, I know. okay, I know this show. All right. Um, uh, Batman animated series for me, easily. Wasn't that going to come back and then they changed it and then farmed it out and now I don't know what the hell's going on with it because it's in that Warner Brothers cyclone of hell? Yeah, I, I hope it stays done, you know? Yeah. Cause, especially because Kevin Conroy oh, passed away. Of course, away. now, yeah. I mean, Mark Hamill, you know, said he was done. But like the fact that we got Arkham Asylum and Arkham City and Arkham Knight are yeah. just yeah. incredible. Yeah. I mean, I I, I know like, the reason I don't say Arkham Origins. I know all the Arkham Origins fans are typing right now. Origins. It's only because <laughs> no Kevin Conroy in there, so it's, it's yep. just the connective tissue. Yeah, or right. Hamill, exactly. You got Troy Baker instead of Hamill. Live with yeah, it. Yeah, my thing with animated sure. series is I I adore that show. That was that's my answer too of like favorite show as a kid. But like, it it kept going to a point where I wasn't watching anymore. Like they changed the art style a little bit. They changed how they drew the characters' eyes and oh, stuff. Oh, interesting. So like, yeah. there is an extension of that show that I could go back and watch, but like, it, I don't really need it to come back. Like, I'm yeah. I'm good. It actually goes pretty far because they do the new right. adventures of Batman, and then they do the Justice League show and right. Justice League Unlimited, and of course Batman Beyond. Yeah, that's canonical. Ten out of ten. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so I remember I, I loved a uh, reboot. You guys remember this? Reboot, yeah. Yeah. yeah, which is like gets crazier as that show goes along because they it stopped being like an American television show and went to Canada and they were like we're gonna we're just gonna make this crazy and it gets good and uh, there was a reboot that they brought to Netflix like six or seven years ago, but what? it's like a it's it's a teen drama. Like it's like, and occasionally they'll go into the computer and fight Megabyte or something. I was, I remember watching the trailer for that, and I was like, "This is, this is." I I can't imagine a show I'm less interested in than this. <laughs> <laughs> like, this is, I don't want this. It's, it's so it. strange. Yeah, was, it's so weird to think about like continuing the storylines because like there's so many cartoons that I loved, but I don't. It wasn't like the Seinfeld finale where I was there watching the end of the storyline. You know, like even I love the X-Men yeah. cartoon growing up and I watched the first episode of X-Men 97. And I was like, oh, Professor X died at the end of that. Like, I, I really had no idea for like where that show left off because you just, yeah, you catch what you can catch and it rules and mm -hmm. moving on. But you're less think, concerned about the overall larger story, you know? 
I, I'm like, I'm certainly getting FOMO from X Men '97, where I'm like, should I check this thing out? But like, I have yes. no affection. But I don't. I didn't. I ha- I haven't watched a single episode of the original show. Uh, I don't. Yeah. I'm not like a big X Men guy. Like, am I? Is it just not for me? And <laughs> I'm I gonna go with it. With might not be for you then, Kyle. Yeah. But then, I, like, I, I, okay, good. That's fine. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. mean, to be fair though, like. I love that original show, but I was much more into the Spider-Man show than the X-Men show. And so some of these things were like, oh, I don't even remember some of these characters. Like, how did I forget about a character like Morph and jumping into X-Men 97? This for you, Morph! (laughs) But Kyle, if this this will sell you, I'm going to spoil one bit of action from the first episode of X-Men 97. So heads up. But like Storm was always my favorite as a kid. And they give her the best thing in the world to do in this new one where they're fighting in the desert in the first episode of X-Men 97. And, and you know, they have some line. Do you remember what the line is, Huber? But like, you know, five star four storm incoming. This had like some like weather alert anomaly is some cool like yeah, way yeah. of like, yeah. like yeah. tossing it to her. And she's just rolling in across the desert, having lightning strike the sand, turning it into glass and then whipping up tornadoes of glass that go it's in and just like strange. destroy it's the enemies. Strange. Yeah, it's like Pretty this cool. is the best thing I've ever seen her do. Um, Storm hype. Yeah, but I was thinking about yeah, what shows that really really love and where do they leave off? And I was trying to dig around on YouTube to find the final episode of Mighty Max. Do you guys? Oh, no, are- I love Mighty Max. Dude. Huber, somehow I knew you <laughs> love Mighty Max. By yes. the way, Jacob is is a, is a is a fair bit younger than us, and yeah, I can just like, be like, like I don't know what you guys. Are <laughs> There's a part of me that's like, oh, did I name Min Max Min Max as like a slight homage, or like deep in my head, I like the word Max because I loved Mighty Max so much that as a kid. Awesome. But I couldn't really yeah. find. There's one called the Final Battle in a clip on YouTube, and I'm like, is this yeah. actually the fi- last episode? I don't I just know. remember Norman and Virgil. Yeah. Is like Hell yeah. <laughs> Um, what about Roughnecks, dude? The Starship Troopers show. Oh, I didn't watch that. It was, was like it good? CG. Yeah. It was like early CG, right? Really? Yeah. Oh, kind of like reboot looking ish, like yeah. kind of a little bit. Except with like they, they hadn't figured out how to do humans properly yet. So oh, it looks lying, but... so bad now. It looks so <laughs> bad, but that'd be cool if it came back. Yeah. Jacob, wake up! Come on, wait. Well, I'm about classic Mighty shows. Max. <laughs> this this is up your alley, Jacob. I watched the the reboot or the continuation of Frasier. Is that up your alley? No, oh, I had like 35 what minutes. What if we told you that one of the funniest primary characters from that show wasn't in it? Would that interest you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no Daphne, no else. But I had like 35 minutes on the flight back. I was like, what could I watch? Is there any show? I was like, oh, you know what? I'm never going to subscribe to Paramount Plus to see this. I am curious <laughs> to see what they do with Frasier and Boston. It turns out, uh, you know, it just feels like a standard kind of mediocre. Make a lot of bad puns. Uh, yeah, that's basically it. So you've got to see it. Everyone, you've got to subscribe to Paramount <laughs> Plus. Come on, you guys. You wouldn't believe the hijinks. Uh, Victor Pham writes in, they ask, why is there sometimes such a disparity between critics and general audiences? Because critics oh, yeah, are I, jaded I, and broken. Is this question, or is it just It's just in that. General? Just, just in, that's it, I guess. I, I think a lot of it has to do with, like, critics are just fully immersed in the medium they're covering right like a a game critic a a film critic watches a million films i play like a million games Mm -hmm. where like the average person plays far fewer games so like the things that i would perceive as like i've done this a million times this is boring somebody else has they haven't done that a million times Mm -hmm. and it's exciting for them and i i think that's that's like the thing that came to me like that that's my thought on it when i when you were presenting us with that question absolutely and the mindset too of like you're not reviewing a game so you you're not as necessarily critical you know you're just playing a game having fun whereas a reviewer it's like you've got to be you know critical and i think it's like if you think about it like with food you know if you were if you went over to someone's house and they gave you fettuccine alfredo you'd be like hell yeah i love fettuccine alfredo you know, thank you. But if you're like a food <laughs> critic, it is your job to like think about that as a, you know, a combination of ingredients and not just the food you like. And so mm-hmm. it's like, you know, as as a critic, you can't just kind of be like, I like Mario. So thumbs up to the Mario movie, you know, because it's like your job is to think about it as a movie, like as yeah. as a medium that is like using the tools to tell its story and like. It's totally fine if you like Mario and so you like the Mario movie, but like that's not really what a critic does. A critic doesn't just like tell you their own like I like this guy and so it's good. 
But doesn't that corny. make you a little bit of an a-hole if you can't just go over to a house and have some fettuccine, fettuccine Alfredo and enjoy well, you it? Know, you know when to turn it on and when to turn it off. Like, mm -hmm. I, I assume the food critics don't be like, mm, could have used a little less pepper. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, that thing that food critics always say. <laughs> more pepper. That's the scale, right? It's like, you know, five stars or whatever. It's like less or more pepper. They're like, yeah, yeah. more pepper, you know what pepper. I, you know what I lose sleep about is... Because everyone has such a strong opinion on it. And I think it's so weird. I love Star Wars. I obviously saw Phantom Menace in the theaters. I don't remember having an opinion about it. I don't remember feeling like, F yeah, or like this ruined my childhood. Oh. It was just like, Star Wars, okay, moving on yeah. with my life. And I feel like in retrospect, I guess becoming a professional critic, wherever the hell I am, like that's so weird just to be able to go to that movie that was so important mm -hmm. and be like, I, don't know, I like the just bubbles. Just enjoy it. Yeah, it's like there's cool stuff, moving on. Like, oh, yeah. You were young, or you like, I was 12, I, I guess. 12. Okay. Yeah. 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 I feel like, too, because, like, critics, the reviews will come out first and kind of set the tone for, like, the expectations of the game. So then there's, like, the the inevitable pushback, you yeah. know, if a game, like, scores really high or scores really low, then people will be like, well, well, actually, it's really good, you know, even though everyone, like, gave it bad reviews. So it kind of, like, changes players' expectations a little bit. Yep, yep. It's, it's a weird cycle for sure. And then I feel like at times... I don't know. I'm trying to think of, was it the critics that like really championed Hollow Knight? I'm trying to think of those games that like just Hollow built Knight. up this hype. And now I feel like critics have to like respond a little bit to like, what yeah. what, what are the quote unquote masses like doing? I feel Deathloop was that. Deathloop got such good reviews everywhere. Yes. And it's like, well, yeah, because I guess <laughs> what's, oh, wow, your, okay. what's your point? Because Ben, Hollow Knight is like universally beloved. So is it like critics making a game liked or is it critics having a different opinion? No, because like the reviews came out for Hollow Knight originally and then it was like, eh, solid, Metrovania. And then it came out on Switch and I feel like there was like this critical mass of then everybody loving it. And so I feel like now critics have gone back to be like Hollow Knight, greatest of all time level. Yeah. I mean, there's a little bit of... if that's... Yeah, I was going to say, I think there's a little bit of like Game Informer office uh, bias there mm. where Game Informer uh... admittedly kind of ignored it at that PC launch and then and then came back around on it on Switch yeah. and that inspired a lot of people in that office to play but which is like that's just the sphere you were in kind of I was there too you know mm, mm. Uh, Sam Kennedy writes in uh, I met this person at GDC uh, saying do centaurs have two rib cages one long one yeah. that's bendy oh, can you imagine <laughs> giving CPR to oh, to a centaur like oh that'd be so gross can you imagine Jacob using like a little xylophone stick and running it along a centaur's full rib cages? <laughs> <laughs> That's my dream. Can you do that in Dragon's Dogma too? It feels like something you you'd be able to. <laughs> yeah, it really does. Yeah. Uh, Tony the Swordsman writes in and says, "What's up? Hello. I wanted to write in and confirm that Ben is tall. Thank you. Um, it was awesome to meet everyone at the MinMax San Francisco Community Meetup and talk to Ben about Mega Man Legends. If anybody wants to meet me in a bar and talk to me about Mega Man Legends, I am all ears at any time." <laughs> Um, but, right now, let's go. Okay, like in a bar or just in this imagined in middle world. Of in a bar, in a bar. Let's go. Meet you there. Okay, let's go. Uh, what's directly <laughs> between LA and Minneapolis? Let's find it. Omaha. I don't know. Anyways, <laughs> Omaha. Yeah. Uh, I forgot uh, to mention. Yeah, we had the San Francisco community meetup at uh, Tempest Bar on Sunday, uh, and so special shout out to everybody who came out. Uh, it's always a scary thing. If no one shows up, I feel like it'd be incredibly embarrassing and strange, but we had a bunch of folks show up. Everyone was so sweet. Uh, enjoyed talking to every single person that came by. So thanks to everybody for coming out to a strange bar in a potentially strange city to meet some strangers and talk about Min Max and talk about games. Like it was just it was just a blast. And special shout out to Justin who saved that space for us at the bar and uh, treated us like um, obnoxious royalty the entire night to the point that it felt <laughs> gross, but I really appreciated that. Um, and then also Tony, um, who uh, owns the bar and made the whole thing happen. So thanks everybody Shout again. Out. That'll be in the travelogue. That'll be up uh, next week as well if you want to see a glimpse of what the, the community meetup was like. Um, Mike Lynch wrote in saying, do you have a favorite oddity in the place you grew up in? Uh, growing up, Mom had a hard time going to the basement to do laundry, so my father cut a hole in the floor of a tiny closet so she could chuck the clothes into a hamper in the basement. Of course, I used to throw toys in the hole and got told to stop playing around the hole. <laughs> I mean, that's that's just working smarter, not harder. That's, that's fun. It. Yeah, yeah, that is fun. Yeah. I've always been jealous of those houses that have, like, the laundry chute because that was my first thought. I was like, oh, my God. 
you could send like little toys down there. Get like the the army men with the parachutes. Would they work going through that <laughs> chute? You could do so many fun things. Um, but yeah, anybody have a house oddity growing up or anything about the region I that mean, pops no. up? There, there are things that you like don't realize are weird about your house yeah. growing up, where it's it's just like that's that's the house you know, and so it doesn't strike you as weird. Uh, my parents uh, to this day have uh, their one full bathroom is on the first floor and then their bedroom is on the second floor right and so we would always like <laughs> i would i would always be like dad why are you walking in a towel through the living room like when i have friends over and it's like because there's no shower on the second floor <laughs> and so the only way out is to like walk through the central gathering area that's and so funny. like that's that's normal you know like yeah. why would why would you need to put a shower near your bedroom <laughs> did, did you need to flex along the way though uh come on mr geller i feel like that's too much yeah i was thinking back to like you know what stood out about where i grew up and i was raising a trailer out in the woods and like the trailer you know, i mean this is like the late 80s and so the trailer was probably made in the early 70s and so it just had the most obnoxious carpet imaginable where it was like, for me and my two sisters, like my sister had like shag carpeting, but it was like red, like as red as you could possibly get it. And then my other sister had like bright blue and I had like bright, gross green carpeting. And just when I think back to that trailer, it's like, like the carpet, like you can't vacuum shag carpeting. Just to have it be like these neon <laughs> colors. It's just <laughs> disgusting in retrospect, Weird. but lovely. Um, Jason Wojnar wrote in, I said, last week you talked about dad's gaming. What about moms, everybody? My mother loved Kaboom and Combat on the Atari 2600. We got it at a yard sale in the 90s. That's so awesome. <laughs> it's like mid-90s playing Atari 2600. Um, recently, cool. she tried to get into Gone Home and was intrigued by the story, but the controls were too hard for her. Yeah, first-person stuff. You don't want to do that. That's going to be too, too complicated. Yeah. But mom gaming memories from anybody here? I got a, a fun one. When uh, Resident Evil came out on GameCube. Yeah. Um, I, I'm really big on playing horror games at nighttime. You know, lights out, drapes pulled, doors doors locked, like maybe a candle lit, that's it. <laughs> Gun loaded. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but I get Resident Evil Remake on GameCube and it's the middle of the day and I just really want to play it. I'm ready to play it. So my mom sets up like all these blankets to block out the window. She like Whoa. stacks books like on the blanket to make my room like pitch black in the middle of the day. <laughs> that cool. is so sweet. It was awesome. It's and did she know what you were playing exactly? Yes. <laughs> my mom to this day will buy me every Resident Evil game that comes out. Shut oh, up. It's like a tradition. She's like, yo, whenever Resident Evil comes out, I want to get it for you. That that's is the sweetest wonderful. thing I've ever heard. Wait, what if you get like codes from Easy Allies? She'll buy me a physical copy. <laughs> Whoa, collector's yep. edition? No, just regular. Cheap, 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 cheap. Tell, tell you don't want that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> a trapezoid writes in. They say, <laughs> Ben, uh, this question is probably mostly for you. Mostly, they say. Uh, in the original Jurassic Park, there's a scene towards the end of the movie where Dr. Sadler is talking to John Hammond about the park, and she says. <clears throat> <clears throat> Okay, this is it's a lot your of Lord Dern impression. Yeah, right? okay. <laughs> I was overwhelmed by the power of this place, but I made a mistake too. I didn't have enough respect for that power, and it's out now. And this line always confused me because it sounds like she starts off referring, refer, <laughs> referring to the metaphorical power of the park, but ends referring to the physical, electrical power of the park. <laughs> <laughs> have I been oh, wow. misunderstanding this quote for 30 years? Am I crazy? No, you're not crazy. It, it, I think it's... <laughs> it's a little bit I, of a poetic okay, yeah, line ahead. in Jurassic Park, but I think as a kid, you just you don't register it for they're trying to be a little flowery. She's trying to put some dramatic spin on there. Uh, so, no, that is exactly what they're doing is they're playing with the two meanings of power. But because fully, I mean, I've I never interpreted it as the electricity being gone. Same, same. I always interpreted it as the power of the dinosaurs have escaped and it is oh, they are now so out. But what do you say? What do you say the power is out? No, oh, you, I guess no. It, it's it's 100% literal. The electricity is out because I didn't have enough respect for that power, and it's out now. When all they've been doing the rest of the scene wait, is talking. You think it's the electricity, Ben? 
One hundred percent. Yeah, no, it's, a, it's out. The power is like the no dinosaurs way are out. It's the electricity. There's no They're way. They're out of the out of their cages. There is no way. It is the electricity that no, she's yeah, talking Michael about here. Yeah. There is a zero percent chance. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Wait. Okay. Which is saying the power. Okay. I was overwhelmed. Maybe a pun. Maybe a pun. But you know. She's, okay. So she starts out. I'm with Trapezer. I think it's a pivot. Who, she's like who. Who the, respects, the point, though? The point... Hang on, Hubert. Let me tell you about Jurassic Park. Yeah, yeah. The point <laughs> okay, is, okay. it's a pivot, and that's what she's working with. I was overwhelmed by the power of this place. That's about just the power of genetic engineering, power of the dinosaurs, no doubt about it. But I didn't have respect for that, and it's out now. I think she's absolutely pivoting to... Uh, I don't know, does a double entendre? What would you call that? To... <laughs> Because the rest of the scene I, is I them, like... I respect it, though, the power of the dinosaurs. Like, who respects, like, electrical power? So, Why would saying, she respect... So you're, okay, so Hubert, here, just to be clear, her saying, I didn't have enough respect for that power, and it's out now, you're saying that's not them playing with the concept of the electricity being out at all? Zero no. percent? Things no. in English you can are out of your mind. one thing no, ever. No way! <laughs> you are out of your mind. Okay, the entire scene, it's like, we gotta eat this ice cream fast because the power's out, and it's melting. That's good context. <laughs> yes! <laughs> That's good context. The context of the entire part of the film is them yeah. being, holy Jesus Christ, the power is out. They say it 500 <laughs> times in that movie. They're not gonna say the power is out now and not at least be playful with that notion. That's what they're doing. Gosh. I don't know. This it's is a very this small is crazy. I, I am gonna run this by the resident Jurassic Park. Council? Super fan Don Casanova. I'm gonna ask him this. Oh, I'm gonna see him later today. I'm gonna see his his take on this. Okay, I'm he not... is a fanatic, Jurassic Park fanatic. To be clear, I'm not that saying. Is to be clear, yeah. I'm not <laughs> saying that her saying, you know, respect for the power over and by the power of this place. That that's 100 all about the electricity. I'm saying it's it's playing with the two notions of power and power. That's what's going on here. I do think I I think so I think it is not playing with it because it does get it undercuts it by making it sort of wordplay when it is kind of a very serious intense scene. I think it's right? a I think it is a hokier scene than we think, and they it is yeah. dramatic wordplay, and it's weird that like she's you know getting emotional as she's saying it, but I mean that entire scene is so hokey. That's John Hammond talking about oh the fleas can't you see the fleas? I mean it is just like <laughs> flea circus. I I love that scene, but it is in the middle of Jurassic Park. It's just like all right. Laura Dern, Nattenborough, just swing for the fences acting-wise. Here you go. I hope you took your acting Something classes. Something real. <laughs> Something they can touch. Feel and touch. It is. Everyone's just so like, epic. it's the hammiest scene. They should be eating ham instead of ice cream in that scene. It's real. Really... <laughs> Before it melts, we gotta finish the ham. <laughs> hurry. Hurry. The raptors will eat it if we don't. Um, okay. Crazy. What do y'all like for question of the week? Huber, yeah. I'll, I'll let I you like lead the way. <laughs> That's good. That's so good. You're going to turn your back on the moms. Ooh, the disparity Ooh. between critics and general audiences. Bringing shows back, I thought was good. Mm -hmm. uh, Thin Mints. Dude, Jurassic Park blew my mind. <laughs> I've never heard this, this take that she's talking about the electrical power. I've never thought it. I've never heard it. This is crazy. She says it's out now. Okay, there we go. Trapezoid, congratulations. You just won question of the week. You just won Grimpen Nego on the Switch. Thanks to I'm 8-Bit. Now it's time for something called Get a Load of This. Uh, hey, get a load of this. Let's stay on the Spielberg train, eh? Uh, I was listening to the You Made It Weird podcast with Pete Holmes, and he had uh, the actor Ryan Hurst on, who was nice. Thor in God of War Ragnarok. And he was Beta in The Walking Dead. Ooh, Great performance. There we go. He blew my mind, though, being a big fan of his performance mm -hmm. uh, as Thor, uh, where he was in Saving Private Ryan. And specifically... Wait, where, who, where was he Thor? I'm sorry. In uh, God of War Ragnarok. Oh, right. okay, You're a okay, okay. Calm yeah. and reasonable person. Yeah. Um, <laughs> great, yeah. yeah. Okay. But he was in Saving Private Ryan, and he was the guy who had the German grenade go mm -hmm. off next to his head. It goes in and out, sir. Like mm -hmm. that guy who tells him where Ryan is, that was uh, Thor from Ragnarok. I had no idea. James Francis Ryan. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> Humor, I went into this being like, God, there's no way in heaven that uh, Huber is not a gigantic fan of Saving Private Ryan. If there's a movie that's like oh, tailor-made, yeah. that's it, right? 10 out uh, of 10. Movies. Got it, got get, it. Get a, get a load of this. Uh, actually, first, Ben, you know what I thought was a good joke of the Oscars? Uh, is when they said, uh, 
this is the kid from the Fablemans. Look at him now. <laughs> yeah. And it was Steven <laughs> That was so good. <laughs> I, I, that's I, thought, I thought that was like an underrated joke in that I did not see people like posting about how funny it was. I but I really so laughed right. at that. Was that a camel I, joke? I agree. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah it was a camel joke. joke. Yeah. I think Kimmel does a great job of those Oscars. I still think it's so funny. I think it was his first time hosting where he's like, hey, whoever gives the shortest acceptance speech tonight wins a jet ski. And they showed the jet ski out on stage and then they held to it. Like it was some, I think the cinematographer had like a seven second speech. Like, all right. And at the end of the night, they show him like riding a jet ski. <laughs> it's <That's> amazing. amazing. <laughs> um, okay. Get a load of this. Um, this is just a tweet uh, where someone was having a text to speech article read about um, the amount of different moves you can make in the game Go, which is yeah. one of those like 10 to the 90 second power, you know, numbers. Uh, but the text to speech just attempts to pronounce one followed by like a thousand zeros. <laughs> and uh, you will never guess uh, in the what the manner it attempts to pronounce this in. Uh, uh, ben, do you want uh, me to send you the link or do you want oh, people to yeah, just sure. uh, post probably this? Probably should, yeah. Let's see if I can um, uh, get it up and running here. Here we go. Uh, should I? I can. I can. Yeah, you go ahead. Well, you want me to do that, Ben? No, I think I got it. I got it. I think it's right here. Uh, okay. Where'd you send it by chance, Jacob? Uh, the Discord text updates. Okay, I'll break everything, but let me do updates. it here. Uh, so break everything. Okay. Things are being broken. I can Power's also put it in out. Slack. Okay, here we go. Azed I was at how brilliantly AlphaGo played the moves it came up with. Go is a doubly complex strategic win. Famously far more complicated than chess. What one of <laughs> that means AlphaGo has to be creative, not just calculated. Oh my god. Oh, Christ. <laughs> yeah, AI. So Maybe we don't need to worry about AI so oh, much. Man. Oh, man. Oh, right top of it. Jacob, did you ever see that book called oh. Seven Games? Uh, came out so. a couple years ago, but it's about <laughs> it takes like Go and chess. Um, trying to remember the other games that are in that batch, and then it's all about just like the best players in the world, and then every chapter is the same. Where it's the best player in the world, and then talks about like a slow increase of AI till eventually oh, AI is sure. just like stomping them. And it's so fun to read just like game after game. Like, no, this one will stand the test of time. Nope, sorry, everything just gets <laughs> tackled. It's really fun. It's a fun story. Uh, <laughs> Hubert, you got one to throw in there? Get a load of this. Is that just a random a random thing, right? A random story? <laughs> yeah, whatever you want, man. Yeah. Uh, get a load of this, actually. I'm a big baseball fan. Of course. Shohei Otani's translator. Did you guys hear about this? No. This is breaking I've news. This happened that name in the, in, the, in the news. I don't know this who is that is. This breaking news. This happened like yesterday. Okay. So Shohei Otani's translator stole four and a half million dollars from him to place bets on like sports gambling and to like pay his debts what insane story yeesh all right there's a link below if you want to dive into this whole thing yeah otani dude so now now that now the theories are running wild that otani was really the one making the bets and that this guy's the fall guy mm. it's out of control Hey, speaking about control, I was thinking about it with GDC, um, and tr speaking about translation reminded me of it. But uh, I went to a talk on like the animations of Spider Man Two, like I mentioned before. We'll talk about it in the bonus pod episode. But they were talking about just the challenge of doing so much sign language in uh, Spider Man Two, you know, with, with Haley. Um, yeah. And I was just sitting there thinking, I was like, I feel like I remember Miles Morales in Spider Man Two pretty well. Ha have they yet not done? anything playing with the idea of the spider-man thwip is i love you in sign language have they not done something with that yet they have not that is the biggest storytelling layup in the world right <laughs> you're right I never thought that. That. yeah but if like he's hanging out with Haley and then miles Morales just is like i love you then thwips away like that's it <laughs> yeah I, okay i look at the dlc maybe they'll, they'll throw it in there okay please or that's the ending <laughs> of the third game yeah uh kyle you got one 
Uh, yeah, hey, get a load of this. This is very straightforward, but I just thought it was silly and weird and interesting. They had um, they did like a Coke versus Pepsi taste test mm. with ants. Oh, and uh, and they prefer Coke. Isn't that weird? <laughs> I'll be damned. <laughs> it's a weird thing. I was like, all right. Oh, Coke must have been so happy. They have the ants. But <laughs> does that mean that if you're having a picnic, you should only have Pepsi? Oh, oh right. This all falls apart. It's probably. the Web3 sucks scenario all over again. <laughs> uh, let's see. In the MinMax Discord, which you get access to if you jump in at the $2 tier on Patreon, um, there is a whole channel dedicated to get a load of this. I was talking with uh, somebody at GDC, which is a sentence I've said too many times on this podcast, and I'll be saying again in the future. But as someone, I was talking about just like not being on Twitter, yada, yada, yada. And um, God, just bragging just about it. About that, don't you? <laughs> I am so not going to say that. Oh, so proud. I, just, I, just I see Ben Hansen tweets all the time. <laughs> I do, but I don't scroll. I don't scroll. It's completely different. I just send it out there and then don't scroll. But anyways, and they're like, they're like, how do you stay up to date on what's going on then? And I was like, oh, the get alert of this channel in the Discord is just like everybody sharing the best bits. And I feel like I don't miss anything big. Um, anyways, in that channel, Chris shared a story from Live Science. Um, and Chris in the community says, by the way, to tie back to a conversation you had on the podcast a while ago, the moon did disappear once and people noticed. And it's the story about how uh, in 1110 AD, there's an English scribe who was writing about like, I don't know what the hell's going on. The moon just disappeared and it was gone for a couple days and then it slowly came back and there's no explanation. It's not like a waning, waxing situation. Like it just faded out of existence. Piccolo and now blew it up. And then it turns out scientists looked into it. Piccolo freaking blew it up, man. <laughs> um, no, but are you watching a lot of Dragon Ball again, Huber? What's going on over there? I, I'm always watching Dragon Ball. No, really? <laughs> always in the rotation. <laughs> because Jake up ready for this. Because I saw you, Huber, I saw you tweet about Goku versus Vegeta. Uh, it it's, like, it's such a good, like, how can you even beat that? You can't. You actually can't. No story has beaten it. But the point is, now scientists are piecing together that uh, this was a forgotten cluster of volcanic events where they're tying together like, oh, like multiple volcanoes around the world went off this year and just Whoa. shrouded the moon in England. And that's why people were so confused and alarmed back in the day. So fun stuff. If, if it was 1110, I would notice that the moon disappeared. Okay. They didn't have anything else going <laughs> on. <laughs> yeah. That was like your, yeah. Wi-Fi being out, uh, Groveland, I think back in the day. Um, but Hey, that's it for this episode of the MinMax show. Thanks everybody for watching or listening. Uh, remember if you are watching, you can always subscribe on Apple podcasts, uh, or if you're listening on another podcast, just subscribe on Apple podcasts, leave a review, any review on Apple podcasts, include some way to contact you, Twitter handle, discord ID, and you are in the running to win one of four codes for Sea of Stars on Steam. I'd argue uh, the sixth best game, best game that released last year, Kyle. Um, or Grand <laughs> Blue. Game. I love that game. There we go. Grand Blue Fantasy Relink on PlayStation. So jump in, leave a review, and win something. I'll reach out uh, over the weekend here. Huber, thank you for being here, sir. Thank you for having me. It's so fun talking to you guys. Yeah. Um, it's a blast. Yeah, I guess your first Monday meeting will be... This coming Monday, it's going to be weird to have you thrown in, but it, start thinking of shows that uh, are too weird to sustain for years, but if you had to do as a one-off or a two-off, would be fun, and that's kind of the sweet spot for new show plus ideas, I guess. Cool. Yeah, also, get ready for some vicious hazing. Like, we <laughs> yeah. do not hold back. It's going to be sweet. It's going to be sweet. Uh, <laughs> Trivia Tower, Tuesday, March 26th. Just a reminder, uh, Rogers Base is going to be joining us. You jump in at that $2 tier on Patreon. You help support MinMax directly, and you compete to win prizes for stuff like Final Fantasy VII Rebirth, Astro A50 headset, I believe it is this time, uh, and a ton more in there. Also, um, the most recent episode of New Show Plus um, was technically New Show Overflow, which is when we hit our goal on Twitch, the sub goal, instead of... Um, doing the new episode of New Show Plus. Well, in addition to that, we go into the archives of ideas that lost the New Show Plus poll and revive one rejected idea. And so the name of this show was Anything But GameStop. And it is Kelsey Lewin and uh, Dan Reichert and I going retro uh, game shopping. It was a fun time. So you can check that out on MinMax's YouTube channel. Hey, that's it. Kyle, Jacob, Huber, thanks so much. Uh, thanks to everybody at the Game Champion tier on Patreon, the $50 tier. You can choose any game under the sun, be declared as champion. Andre Silva, champion of Final Fantasy X. Trampoline Tales, the champion of Luck Be a Landlord. Be a landlord. Patrick Polk is the champion of Helldivers 2. And Pretty Good Printing is the champion of Quop. Brilliant choice. All right. 
Thanks so much, everybody. Hey, we'll see you next week for a whole new episode of this whole thing. Thanks, everybody. Be good. Have fun. Let's go. Live episode. No outro. Sorry. Bye, everybody. <laughs>